We're here at Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia, at South Carolina, taking on number 11, the Georgia Bulldogs, in the SEC opener for both these teams. I'm Mark Jones, along with Bob Davey and Stacey Dales down in the field. Georgia accepted the opening kickoff and has taken it all the way down to the South Carolina 25-yard line. But the story behind that drive so far has been two very untimely penalties, one a personal foul against South Carolina. First down and 10 for Georgia at the 25. Thomas Brown this time stopped up right at the line of scrimmage by Casper Brinkley and Rodney Paul. And Mark, just to set the stage right here for the fans just tuning in, South Carolina's defense was off the field, but they had a personal foul penalty on a third down well after the play. Then they had an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, so two 15-yard penalties against this South Carolina defense as we look at a beleaguered <laughs> Steve Spurrier over there early in this football game. Steve Spurrier proclaimed that his team was ready to challenge for the SEC championship this year. This after two years of settling for less than spectacular finishes up to his season. Expectations anyway. Here's a little screen. Massaquah, there's a flag down, and he's down at the 19 yard line, about four yards short of the first down. The 16th time that these two teams have met in their conference opener. And this is going to come back. Both teams coming in undefeated. Georgia defeating Oklahoma State last week. South Carolina beating Louisiana Lafayette. Here's During the, the run, holding 77 offense. 10-yard penalty, repeat second down. Mark the true freshman Trenton Sturdevant, the big left tackle. Last week, Georgia was so much success on those wide receiver screens. On second down, they come with the screen, and big Trenton, the true freshman out of North Carolina, gets the holding penalty. We're going to get to see it right there. He hooked them just a little bit. Got to keep those big, long arms in a little closer to the body. Three new starters on that offensive line for Georgia this year. A trips and right formation. They're going to run it, though, into the boundary. Thomas Bradley, no Sean Moreno. The freshman, the redshirt freshman, who had a big week last week, brought down by Casper Brinkley. Casper Brinkley and Casper Brinkley, a couple of twins doing a nice job on the defensive side of the ball. And for Casper, a bit of a transition moving from defensive end to linebacker. But already in this football game, Casper Brinkley has stood out. Mark, he's had a sack rushing as a defensive end. He played great man-to-man -man coverage one time on the tight end. And right there made a great play against the run. So already 51 has made an impact in this game. Third and 15 for Georgia. The 11th play of the drive. Stafford incomplete for Bailey and he overshot his receiver that might have been six points and in comes the field goal unit for the Georgia Bulldogs and Mike Mark last week Sean Bailey ran a corner route for a big game this time he fakes the corner and goes back to the post and he's wide open Right here, South Carolina thinks he's going to run the corner route. He breaks it back inside, and he was open. Here's Brandon Patu from 48 yards out, and all SEC place kicking selection, but this time hooking it a little bit to the left. So after an 11 play drive, Georgia comes up with zeros on the scoreboard. The game cops with the ball on offense when we come back. This ESPN2 telecast is available in brilliant high definition on ESPN2 HD, presented by Pioneer Kuro. Back at Sanford Stadium, first down and 10 for the South Carolina Gamecocks, operating from their own 30-yard line. Boyd is the lone back. Mitchell firing incomplete at the 35-yard line. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Jones, along with Bob Davies. Stacey Dale's down in the field. We'll hear from her shortly. Bob, South Carolina has lost to Georgia five consecutive times, but throw all the numbers out the window because this game really is a barometer for how each team will do the rest of the way. Hey, Mark, times. a lot of fans around the country, they don't realize what a bitter rivalry this is. I mean, the first thing, they have geography. These two schools are only 170 miles apart. So a lot of these coaches, a lot of these fans grew up around one another. And bigger than that, it's no secret that these Georgia fans dislike Steve Spurrier. And that time the Gamecocks get to the quarterback and sack Blake Mitchell. It was number 38, Marcus Howard. 
with the sack on the play. And for more on the defense, it's journalists, actually the offense from South Carolina, Hootie and the Blowfish's Darius Rucker. Here we go. We'll start with the game cuts, and we got the two seniors that we love. We got Blake Mitchell playing quarterback, who's been in Spurrier's system for a few years, so Blake's time to show up. We got the big man bringing a downhill cold boy, who's just tough to bring him down, tough to bring him down. We got on the outside, we got Kenny McKinley, who's a junior, and I hope he's a senior here next year, but, you know, you guys got to make plays. And on the O-line, where everything happens, where we have it, 6 4 3 0, 7 That's what I'm talking about, the big boys. We got senior William Brown, and we got two new stars, but it's time for us to, you know, step up, make the play, go game. All right, Darius, you are so right. Uh, running over that big offensive line on the left side that time, Corey Boyd got a nice chunk of real estate, but not enough to prevent the three and out. And uh, Steve Spurrier with a couple of instructional words, Brown, for his wide receiver, McKinley. I'll tell you what, right here, Mark, excellent return man for Georgia. Mikey Henderson back here, number 27. This guy can fly, had a big return last week against Oklahoma State. Ryan Suck, a punting from his own 20. He's second team all SEC as a punter. Henderson from the 18 yard line. Looking for an alley and got a bright light ahead of him. And it shut down to the 42 yard line. But the electricity certainly flows when Henderson touches the ball. A 24 yard punt return off a 52 yard punt by Ryan Suckup. Matthew Stafford working with good field position when we come back to Sanford Stadium after this. ESPN's College Football Primetime brought to you by Taco Bell. Think outside the box. And ESPN Game Plan. See the most college football every Saturday. To order, call your pay-per-view provider. ESPN Game Plan lives here. Prior to the game, the prideful procession that takes place, they call it the dog walk. And back at Sanford Stadium from the 41-yard line, Georgia and South Carolina knotted at zero so far. Steve Spurrier last week called his Gamecocks a quote-unquote group of average stiffs after their win. And Stacey Dales, he gives you the undistilled truth, even if it hurts your feelings, right? <laughs> oh, there's no question about it, Mark. He's not a welcomed man here in Georgia. But in a recent poll, actually, by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution for Georgia fans, which measured the most hated SEC coach, Steve Spurrier, as you see right here, tallied almost half of the votes and it certainly helps doesn't help his cause at 11 and 3 all time against Georgia guys but we asked him this week about the Georgia fans he said if they do hate me I just hope they hate me after the game Saturday night Mark <laughs> he's consistent and the defense comes up with a sack back at the 31 yard line their second of the game this time it was Rodney Polk and that time Tyrone Nix heats up Matt Stafford with a linebacker blitz. He brings number 45, Rodney Polk. If we go ahead and run it right there, kind of a delayed blitz right there. And again, this young offensive line from Georgia, Mark, again starting two freshmen on the offensive line. Yes, Spurrier getting back to him. He really gave it to his defense last week. They gave up over 250 yards rushing against Louisiana Lafayette. Third down and long, 19 to go out of the backfield. Thomas Brown gets back some of the yardage out to the 40-yard line. It'll be fourth down coming up for the Georgia offense. The tackle made by Stoney Woodson as we go back to Stan Barrett for a Sports Center in-game update. All right, Mark. Oregon trying to put Michigan away, but they fumble in the red zone. Michigan recovers. A touchdown there might have ended it, but still lots of work for the Wolverines to do down 32-7 in the third. Final from Boston College and NC State 37-17 and Florida State trailing UAB 17-3 at home. Mark, you can only wow. imagine sitting in Michigan Stadium right now. That atmosphere in Ann Arbor, it is brutal there right now. Can't let Appalachian State beat you twice, right, Bob? <laughs> Out to the 38-yard line, it's Captain Munnellen with the punt return. I knew I should have put a patent on that line too late years baby. ago when I used it. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. Back with more after this. <laughs> How much do you pay when you buy a stock? You or a loved one was diagnosed. The 25 greatest players in college football history, presented by IBM, coming in one week. 
end, getting it done. Back at Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia, I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey and Stacey Dales. First down and 10 for South Carolina. Blake Mitchell working out of the shotgun. Hands it off to Corey Boyd, who gets a few. And now let's meet the Georgia defense, introed by Deborah Norville. The Bulldogs defensive line is led by senior Marcus Howard. He is a South Carolina native, so today's game puts him up against his home state school. Over at linebacker, we've got Danielle Ellerby in the middle. He led the Dogs defense with seven tackles last week. And in the secondary, the leader is Keelan Johnson. Keelan's a senior majoring in speech communications. So when you hear him talk, you might realize that you just may be listening to a future TV anchor. Go Dogs! I'll second that, Deborah Norville. He can talk. And his talk backed up by his play. Nice run that time by Mike Davis. Hey, Deborah had a little southern drawl there at the end when she said go dogs uh -huh. you don't hear that on no. network television no <laughs> they've coached that out of her but when she did the lineup she had a little she reverted back yeah on. oh yeah. yeah got back to the roots a little bit and there's a look at keelan johnson last week with a big week had an interception the leader of that secondary probably the leader of that defense from daytona beach florida mainland high school and this young georgia defense six new starters last week mark against oklahoma state I thought they played outstanding. I mean, at five different guys sack the quarterback. So traditionally, a lot of speed up front for for Georgia on defense, and that's the key to this game. Can South Carolina pass protect against this rush of the Georgia defense? Yeah, last week, this Georgia defense kept hearing about how wonderful and outstanding, how prolific Oklahoma State's offense was supposed to be, and that gave them motivational fuel for the entire game. Boyd and Davis in the ball game a couple of running backs Mitchell with time completes it to McKinley for the first down at the 33 yard line of the Bulldogs brought down by Rashad Jones what you'll notice about a Steve Spurrier offense mark that quarterback sets his feet and throws the ball on rhythm first zone coverage there's no wasted steps there's no wasted motion he wants the ball and the receiver to be at a spot on the field simultaneous and take advantage of a weakness in the zone this guy right here is a good player mark that's Blake Mitchell missed last week's game against Louisiana Lafayette because he did not attend as many classes as he was supposed to during summer session, but they picked up 19 on the last play. Mitchell to the edge. And a flag called on the play. It was intended for Freddie Brown, who was working against Brian Evans. Brown getting the start this week in place of Mo Brown. Pass interference, defense number three. Ball be placed in the spot of the foul. Automatic first down. You take a look at Brian Evans. They tell me he runs a 4-2-6, the fastest player on Georgia's defense. Mark, but what you see right there, he never looked back to the football. And as a result, he had a collision that was probably unnecessary with Freddie Brown right there. So look back and play the ball. Came on late last year. Had his best game of the season in their bowl game, their victory against Virginia Tech. Stafford and Boyd are lining up out of the eye behind Mitchell. And now Mitchell with an audible, and it is <laughs> tough to hear, I would imagine, down there. Backside pressure, and it's incomplete. And we go back to Stan Verrett in the studio. All right, Mark. Time for Taco Bell Studio Update. We told you about UAB. Getting out to a big lead on Florida State. Here's how they did it. Sam Hunt with a touchdown. And 17-3, the Blazers over the Knolls right now in Tallahassee. Wow, well, you talk about surprises. Florida State trying to shake off the Clemson hangover. In a big matchup in this game, Marcus Howard, who runs a 4-4-5-40 mark size defensive end against big James Meredith this guy right here is something else he's about 235 pounds and can fly 
Little screen pass complete to Cook. Cook, a good runner as a tight end inside or right at the 10-yard line and near that first down. He appears to have gotten it on the 10-yard pickup. Cook and Boyd, a couple of prolific tight ends who figured prominently in their offensive scheme last week. And Steve Spurrier told us about the tight end. You can see right here, he faked the block, allowed the speed of the Georgia defense to get upfield. But Jared Cook, 6'5", 260, and really kind of a wide receiver. You could tell in our conference call, Mark, that something was up with Jared <laughs> Cook because Steve Spurrier mentioned his name several times. Well, it was interesting how Spurrier, after the win last week against Louisiana Lafayette, called his team, quote, a group of average stiffs, end quote. And then he later revised his assessment just a little bit, but that is the essence of the man they sometimes affectionately call the visor. You get undistilled truth. And here's what he said. Maybe I overstated our team. I was hoping we were past those kinds of games, but we're not past that. It's frustrating, but it is what it is. got to keep coaching. got to keep making changes and find the guys that will get the job done. Third down and one to go for South Carolina. You know, Mark, not everybody can play and coach for Steve Spurrier because and he tells the media about your performance as a player and a coach, but you gotta love it because he says what is in his heart. Man. Sure does. And Spurrier had a very good record against Georgia as the head coach of Florida. He was 11 and one against Georgia while the head coach of the Gators. And we talked about some of the reasons why there are some rancorous feelings, some bitter feelings by these fans in Athens for Spurrier. I remember a time when. He was beating uh, Georgia, and they asked him why he threw that late touchdown to make the final total 52. He said, I thought I'd call it and see what it was like to score 50 against Georgia in Athens because nobody had ever done it before. Yeah, he put 52 on Georgia and Ray Goff here back in the early 90s. These Georgia fans have never forgot it. Touchdown. Boyd with a great shake and move on Keelan Johnson in the Gamecocks score first. And Mark, we talked about Keelan Johnson, the second leading tackler on this team last year. And watch this move by Corey Boyd in the open field. I mean, he just breaks Keelan Johnson down. Wow. And really, we love Keelan Johnson, but a poor effort right there by Keelan. Corey Board with his third rushing touchdown of the season had a couple last week in that win against Louisiana Lafayette the second leading returning rusher in the SEC and look at this move reading his blocks well and South Carolina gets on the scoreboard first like they did a week ago and what a great answer by South Carolina Mark remember on the first series of the game on defense South Carolina with a personal foul an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, two 15-yard penalties. They have recovered right now. That was an impressive drive. Yeah, they really have rediscovered their poise, especially on offense. Remember, these two teams have met the last five consecutive years, and each time Georgia has won, this is what it looked like last year. The Georgia defense pitching a shutout. 18 to nothing was the final. The Gamecocks gained 255 yards but missed a few field goals and had some costly fumbles and turnovers. It was Georgia's first shutout since a 30 to nothing win to start the 2003 season. You know, Mark, I think South Carolina is in a great position coming into this game because they won last week against Louisiana Lafayette, but they didn't play very well. So it was easy for this guy right here to spread a sense of urgency all week in practice. And you know that 18 nothing loss last year, that was personal to Steve Spurrier. Bob, what about the fact that South Carolina and Steve Spurrier didn't really have to show their hand because Blake Mitchell didn't play a quarterback? Does it make it tougher to scout them a little bit for this week's game if you're Georgia? You know what? Willie Martinez, the defensive coordinator from Georgia, he's gone back five years <laughs> scouting Steve Spurrier. You are what you are, so you prepare for Steve Spurrier, not the quarterback you're going to get in the game. A good point. And now out of the end zone, Thomas Brown, five yards deep. Brown out to the 22-yard line. Talked about this being the 60th meeting between Georgia and South Carolina. A couple of schools separated by about 175 miles of interstate highway. Four of the last six games have been decided by six or fewer points. Last season, we showed you highlights of the shutout. 
Steve Spurrier has beaten Tennessee. He has beaten Florida, but he has yet to beat Georgia. And Mark, it comes down to South Carolina stopping the run against Georgia because Georgia has jammed it down their throats the last two years. North Carolina with some large, supersized linebackers that seemingly move pretty well. Moreno, the redshirt freshman, running between the tackles out to the 23-yard line. Eric Norwood making the stop on the play. He was first-team freshman All-American a season ago. Mark, and we talked about that rush defense. 238 to 43, Georgia outrushed South Carolina 05. 198 to 35 in 06. They will not run the football against South Carolina tonight. That was uh, Tyrone Nix, the defensive coordinator uh, on the sideline earlier, telling us that uh, the defense could have used a little more fire and brimstone last week. And a hot rope thrown complete to Trip Chandler, complete from Stafford. That'll go for 13 yards and a first down for the Bulldogs. And Mark, the reason I say they won't run the ball, you look at Tyrone Nix. If you're the defensive coordinator for Steve Spurrier, don't let the other team keep the ball for a long time so Steve can't play offense. So he's going to put eight and nine guys up there. If Georgia scores, he wants them to score fast because that head coach is impatient over there. You trying to tell me that he's sweating not only because it's warm down there, there are other reasons? I'm just telling you, <laughs> you coach defense for Steve Spurrier, it's a great job because he lets you do what you want to do, but you better stop the run and get that ball back for that offense. There's some accountability. Here's Moreno who accounted himself well last week. The redshirt freshman out of Bedford, New Jersey, stopped by Casper Brinkley, but last week he accounted for 121 total yards out of the team's 300. 76. He is in a very effusive, very electric running back. He gives you the quote unquote wow factor on offense for Georgia. Nice run sets up a second down and seven. Kind of thrown around that mini Herschel Walker tag already <laughs> for no shot. High praise, a little receiver screen. Looks like they're going to try and throw it again, but South Carolina reading it well. The ball loose. A.J. Bryant was there trying to throw it. Former quarterback in high school, but he couldn't get the pass off. And that insult to injury comes up limping. Mark, what they wanted to do was a double pass. You see no Sean Marino in the backfield. They're going to throw the quick screen out here, and they wanted to throw it back across the field. But a great job by South Carolina on the backside and also the pressure of South Carolina's defense. They couldn't get the ball back. It's going to be ruled an incomplete pass. This is not Oklahoma State's defense on that field right now like last week for Georgia. Yeah, so far, that is the early prevailing theme of the game. South Carolina's defense taking it to the offense of Georgia. Stafford throws behind his intended receiver. That was Sean Bailey. And it's fourth down and seven to go for the Bulldogs, and they'll punt. Georgia a little bit disconcerted on that series. Let me show you what South Carolina is doing. They're playing man-to-man -man coverage. Then on the snap, they're going to drop a robber down one of the safeties looking for those crossing routes. Mark, see that safety drop down right there? Mm. So you get man-to-man, -man, you want those inside routes, but they're dropping the safety down in the hole right there. Ryan Mims with his second punt of the afternoon. That's Captain Munnerlin standing on his own 25-yard line for South Carolina. A high spiral by Mims, and Munnerlin calls for the fair catch at the 18-yard line for South Carolina. A 42-yard punt, nothing on the return. We go to Stan Barrett. All right, Mark, Notre Dame and Penn State. Notre Dame's offensive problems last week well chronicled. Getting some help from their defense this week. Anthony Morelli picked off by Darren Walls. But that's not all. Walls has taken this one all the way back, 74 yards. Remember, Notre Dame's offense managed just 122 yards last week against Georgia Tech. But the Irish out to a 7-0 lead and Jimmy Clausen with some breathing room. Jury still out on Anthony Morella, the quarterback of Penn State. Taking a while, hasn't yeah, it, Bob? really has. I mean, high expectations, very inconsistent. Mike Davis in a tailback. 
behind the quarterback Blake Mitchell making his first start of the season. They hand it off to Culliver. And he gets a first down out beyond the 30 to the 33 yard line. Chris Culliver, the freshman, one of a couple very talented freshmen they expect to handle the ball today. This the last drive, Bob. You see that impressive drive by South Carolina. Blake Mitchell back, who did not play last week. And then Corey Boyd, the big touchdown run, making Keelan Johnson miss in the open field. Yeah, How about did. that young freshman receiver, Chris Culliver, 17? They love him at South Carolina. Blake Mitchell last week heard a lot of boos. Shouts like, go to class and you're a bum, Mitchell. And that was from the home fan, Stacey Dales. It's rough down there. Uh, no question. It's deafening, actually, down here, Mark. But I had a chance to talk to quarterback Blake Mitchell about the suspension and about the way that his teammates, most importantly, view him. And he said, you know what? He said, I walked out on that field, and they told me that I am the leader. They verbalized it to him. They believe in him. They respect him. And they trust him with the ball in his hands, guys. He's a fifth-year senior, and they won't look to anybody else for leadership than him with the ball. They missed last week's game because of that uh, aforementioned suspension. Last year, after the first two games of the regular season, he was benched and didn't win the job back until later in the season. Here's Mitchell on the move, going to tiptoe out of bounds at the 43-yard line. Gained about five on the play with 14 seconds to go here in the first period. And there's a late flag on the play now. Looks like it's going to go against South Carolina. Freddie Brown was in the area. We're talking about South Carolina, they had a very talented recruiting class this year as Ellerby is down injured on the field a little shaken up for Georgia Mark that was a vicious block by number 82 Freddie Brown and really a cheap shot watch Freddie Brown all the way right here coming back towards the football that's uncalled for in my opinion that is uncalled for now wow that's how guys get hurt it's good to see Danelle Ellerby up right there Mark, you're allowed to chop a defender, but you're not allowed to chop from behind coming back towards the football. Let's take a look again. I think you have to call that. I mean, technically wow. his head was in front, uh -huh. but he was coming back towards the ball right there. And Mark Richt is boiling on the sidelines after that quote unquote non-call. Be a 30 second timeout. Take one more look at this. And Mark, that is not reviewable. You cannot review that on an official's call like that that involves a penalty. Again, keep in mind, you're allowed to chop. That is really, really close right there. But the NCAA making such a conservative effort to protect players yeah. and student athletes welfare. I think you have to call that. Yeah, Eller being one of the uh, key cogs defensively for Georgia. Freddie Brown getting to start meanwhile at receiver for South Carolina. There's a look at uh, Ellerby who last week had an outstanding game in the middle. He was one of the leaders on defense for Georgia in that win against the Oklahoma State Cowboys. Well, the night of college football on ESPN continues with a clash of two top ten ranked teams. Number nine, Virginia Tech, taking on number two, LSU. College football primetime presented by Hampton Saturday night on ESPN at 9.15 p.m. Eastern time. Bob, we'll get back to the hotel and uh, get that one up on the big screen, huh? You like defense, don't you? Yes. Yeah. I don't mind watching You're a little. You're going to get chicken wings and Jack defense Mountain. tonight, baby. <laughs> that's chicken the recipe. Chicken wings and all defense on that big screen that's, tonight. That's what Saturday night's all about. Mitchell working out of the shotgun. Oh, what a nice catch by his back. Davis makes the grab, and that's the end of the first period of play with four, actually three seconds to go. How about that catch, Mark? Picked up six yards, and uh, hey, this South Carolina team, after a pretty a tumultuous beginning, a couple of personal foul calls, their head coach, Steve Spurrier, uh, losing his visor, losing his temper a little bit, composing themselves, and end the first period with a seven to nothing lead. And this is the 60th edition of Georgia and South Carolina. Back after this. 
Stan Verrett back here in the studio with an update on our other two games on the ESPN Family and Networks. I don't know if Notre Dame's got the chicken wings, but they got some defense so far. 74-yard interception return for a 7-0 lead on Penn State. And more big problems at the big house over on ABC for Michigan, Oregon, thumping the Wolverines. Yes, yeah, Stan, they might have had a little bit too much hot sauce on those chicken wings. At least Michigan, I speak of. Corey Boyd now split out as a wide receiver on second down and four. Blake Mitchell orchestrating this offense pretty well so far. Completes another pass. That's Boyd still on his feet at the 44-yard line, and he gets another first down. Well, Blake Mitchell has been a rough ride for him over the last uh, several months. Bob was suspended during the summer for not going to enough classes, and then going back even to last year, was benched after the first two games, got into a brawl in an off-campus bar, was suspended for a game after that, after he lost the job, but then uh, salvaged his season in the last four games of the year and really came on late, completing about 70% of his passes. Well, Stacy brought up the point about can Blake Mitchell lead this football team? And I agree, no question he can because he's tough and he gives them the best chance to win. And Mark, you know those, that's what those players want. They want to win and they know this is the guy for them. Well, the quarterback that will go to the mat for his team. Play of game, offense, five-yard penalty, remains first down. I mentioned it was a little bit of a rocky summer, some off the field incidents for South Carolina. Bobby Wallace, Chris Hale, James Thompson, and Jordan Lindsay ruled academically ineligible just last night. I mean, you see a lot of academic issues, and I can't help but wonder Steve Spurrier with that strong statement on Media Day about South Carolina's admissions policy. A lot brewing right now academically, it seems, at South Carolina. On first and 15, Davis couldn't elude the tackler before midfield, and a nice stop on the play by Rashad Jones on Davis. And I tell you what, Georgia wanted holding right here. If we watch the left tackle, 77, right there, reach out Jamin Meredith. That's a big dude right there, Mark. That's about 6'6". Six, six. 295, 300 pounds. Tell you, down on the field before the game, Bob, uh, both teams passed the eye test. Yeah, they're two good-looking football yep. teams, Mark. You're right. They both make all airports. <laughs> but the speed of these Georgia defensive ends, right here, this guy, Marcus Howard, who's probably outweighed 70 pounds in that matchup right there. And Marcus Howard is T. Spurrier's team calls a timeout. Howard wearing a different number today. You know, you look at Steve Spurrier, who is a great offensive coach, but you know, his impact in college football, Mark, may not have been as dynamic as what people thought getting back into the college game. But I think one thing that's really changed, you go back and look at Spurrier in the early 90s at Florida, he was the only one doing the empty, no back, wide receiver screen wide receiver reverse now every week in college football you see that wide open offense so defenses have kind of caught up to the passing game a little bit since then yeah, he's such an innovator though going back through the years he won the 1966 heisman trophy as a gator quarterback first round draft choice with the 49ers later with the buccaneers spent three years with duke taking them to the all-american bowl in 1989 then back at his alma mater as head coach he won the 96 national championship followed by a couple of years with the Washington Redskins which didn't quite work out as well as he would have hoped and now on the sidelines in Columbia South Carolina and he is so good for college football because he's like a lightning rod <laughs> I mean he stirs controversy now Will receive a screen complete and a nice game by Kenny McKinley on the play, but still about six yards shy of the first down. Got a good block that time, Bob, from Jared Cook. Anytime you throw those wide receiver screens, Mark, you have to block. You can see 84, Jared Cook right there. The other block by Freddie Brown and Kenny McKinley, who was a quarterback. But anytime you run wide receiver screens, your buddies, those other wide receivers, have to make blocks. 
To see what Willie Martinez's defense dials up for the Bulldogs here on third down in about five. A little blitz coming. Mitchell has a receiver and overshot him at the five yard line. He had Mo Brown open behind the two defenders. He had hit his last five passes before that incompletion. And I'll tell you what, this brings up an interesting decision right here for Steve Spurrier. Pretty good protection right here against the Blitz. They have it blocked, but the wide receiver, Mo Brown, never really looked back for the ball, Mark. All of a sudden, it's man-to-man -man coverage. He has a step. Just not the right timing right there. They're going to go for it here on fourth down and five. Yeah, it would be a 57-yard field goal. And they do have an all-conference place kicker in Ryan Suckup, who hit a 55-yarder against Vandy last year, so he has that type of leg strength. Play of game, offense. Five-yard penalty, still fourth down. Well, that means he's going to punt the football right there because he took the play of game. Yeah. Which surprises you a little bit, doesn't it? With Steve yeah. Spurrier. We're going to take a short break and come right back to Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia. Actually, after the punt, we're going to stay right here, right now. And uh, Steve Spurrier's team leading seven to nothing. And this is the conference opener for both crews. Mark, their defense, talking about South Carolina's, is playing so well right now early in this game. That's why he decided to do that. But I am a little bit surprised on fourth down and five. That the offensive yeah. coordinator Steve Spurrier wouldn't have gone for that right there. Well, Steve Spurrier has said that uh, he is ready for his team to take that next step and challenge for a conference championship and winning on the road in the SEC at a place like Sanford Stadium would be paramount. Second punt of the afternoon for Ryan Suffolk from his own 45. Ends it up high and it comes down to the 15 yard line. And now we're going to take a timeout after that 31 yard punt. Back with more after this. All right, and welcome back to Athens, Georgia. Well said. Actually, Mark Rick, the head coach of the Georgia Bulldogs, talked to his team with a militaristic type theme about selflessness. That was part of his pregame message. Thomas Brown on the handoff over the left side out near the 20 yard line as we go back to Stan Verrett for a Sports Center in game update. All right, Mark, the handball coach's old team, Florida, hosting Troy. Tim Tebow impressive last week and off to a good start this week with a Russian touchdown there. And the Gators with a 14 7 lead on the Trojans. Hey, Troy State can score some points. Yeah. Troy State, it, the question is, can they stop Florida? But Troy State offensively, I think, will move the ball a little bit. Is Tim Tebow the best running back on that team? Well, he's for real. <laughs> Maybe the best linebacker. After that 70 yard pickup here, Stafford. It's Bailey for the first down out near the 30 yard line. Sean Bailey had a big week last week, and that really punctuates his comeback from an ACL injury, a knee injury that he suffered over a year ago. Here's what it looked like last week against Oklahoma State. Five catches for a total of 87 yards. Had a chance to meet with him at the football offices a little bit earlier yesterday. Baba, really pleasant young man with a, a real effusive and great smile. He and Mark, his dad played in the NFL nine years as a receiver, but I think the key for Sean Bailey, how does he handle man-to-man -man tight press coverage? Because last week, as we know, Oklahoma State played a lot of off, soft coverage. These two cornerbacks from South Carolina, Captain Munnerlin, number one, and Carlos Thomas, they'll get up in your face now and play bump and run man-to-man -man coverage. So that's the key for this Georgia offense, particularly the wide receiver. Well, Bob, you said it yourself. I mean, don't receivers always say, ooh, I love to see man coverage? They always say that. <laughs> but, Mark, I know from coaching, they like you to be off, soft, and play in zone now so they can okay. just pick you apart. Feel to their manhood a little bit on that man-to-man -man defense coverage. Second down and seven coming up. Nothing doing on the handoff as we go downstairs to Stacy. Yeah, Mark, you guys take a, a look at Sean Bailey and what he did last week, but you know, they really attribute the wide receivers' development to more toughness this year. When we spent a lot of time with offensive coordinator Mike Bobo and Sean Bailey in meetings this week, and they told us that the culture has changed offensively. We're blocking this year, we're doing different things more physically out on the football field, and it's really paying off for Sean Bailey and the rest of the guys. Yeah, great point, Stacy. Actually, when Muhammad 
Fred Masakwa made a big block on a touchdown run last week. The entire sideline group really erupted. Recognizing Muhammad Masakwa's contribution on the play, and that is a nice contribution by Trip Chandler back this week in the lineup. Close to the first down, depending on where they spot this ball. Mark, that time Georgia gets zone coverage, and the tight end was going to get down and just sit right between the two linebackers in the zone. Little surprised that South Carolina doesn't come up and play more man to man, but Trip Chandler, a guy, did not play last week with a one game suspension, and they are happy to have this guy back. First down and 10. Henderson in motion to the top of your screen. Low fake by Stafford, and this is Sutherland out of the backfield. He led the team in scoring a season ago, and when he touches the ball, he really ignites things. He makes things happen. He picked up nine that time. Jasper Brinkley making the tackle. Mark, anytime you play man to man, that means a linebacker has to cover the back. And there you see the fullback. On Jasper Brinkley, the fullback could not get out in coverage because it was a run play action fake right at him. So you attack man to man with the underneath guys, the fullback and the tight end. This guy's a good receiver right here. He is. Led the team in scoring a season ago. 9.24 to go in the first half. Georgia yet to score. Wilson in motion. The toss into the boundary. That's Thomas Brown. Waited patiently for his blocking to develop. And with a nice gain out to the 36 yard line and to get another first down on the play. Good straight arm on Chris Hampton. I'll tell you, I'm impressed with the play calling by Mike Boba. If it's man to man, he picks on the weakness with the tight end and the back. If it's seven man front zone, he ran the football. Bob, here's our Aflac trivia question. Three SC teams have never beaten a Steve Spurrier coach team. Can you think of them? The guys in the truck really going after us this week. Oh, I'll tell you what. <laughs> the 12 yard pickup on that last one. Wilson in motion again. They come right back to Brown. Thomas Brown down near the 30 yard line. Paul making the stop on the play and number 20 white there in the red jersey coming off the field. One of the unquestioned leaders of this team suffered a knee injury last year in week seven on a kickoff return and was lost for the seizure and season had surgery in October wasn't cleared to play until around late April early May and came back and really touched the ball for the first time last week and scored on his first run of the season against Oklahoma State. At 10 rushes for 41 yards so far in this game. This is his understudy, Moreno. Turning the edge, and Moreno got a nice block by Chandler. Mark, you're going to get two excellent blocks. The tight end, Trip Chandler, right here. And then you're going to get the fullback, Sutherland, out on the perimeter. Two Excellent blocks, and then you give the ball to this guy right here. Boom, that chop block right there by Sutherland. Excellent block by the tight end, Mark. This guy's exciting, 24. Oh, he sure is. There's a lot of buzz when he touches the ball. Brown comes back into the ball game. A single back formation of four receivers set here. Moreno in motion. They look for Moreno. And it's incomplete. Wisely throwing it away was Matthew Stafford. Eric Norwood providing pressure that time on the defensive front. Mark, you know the thing that impresses me so much about Thomas Brown? He was injured last year on a kickoff return against Vanderbilt. And you know, Stacy's had an ACL. You know what it takes to come back from an ACL. He not only is a gunner on the punting, he returns kickoffs again this year after coming off an ACL injury a year ago. I mean, this guy is a warrior, number 20. Well, you think he'd be a little bit reticent or shy about coming back to do the same deal again. Marino in the backfield. 
and hand it off to the retro freshman and he gets down inside the 10 just barely and you talk about his explosiveness how combustible he is Marino they say that in practice sometimes he'll make a great run and just to turn heads afterwards he'll do a backflip in pads and we asked him about it I said Did, were you a gymnast when you were younger he said no I just felt like doing a backflip and I could do it I'm gonna tell you, you should be doing backflips <laughs> Greg Schiano yeah. this kid's oh. out of Jersey so is Corey Boyd the starting tailback from South Carolina that's two guys yeah. And I think that's what Greg Schiano is doing a much better job of now, keeping these guys in the state now. Well, play of the drive. They come back the opposite way. Receiver screen. Well read by that game top defense, and especially Darian Stewart. Approaching seven and a half minutes to go. The pass complete to Mikey Henderson. Mark Darian Stewart didn't start last week, number 32. But watch this read right here in the speed. They tried to get big Trenton Sturdivant, the big tackle out there. And Darian Stewart just out quick him out there in space. Brandon Petuin to attempt the field goal from 33 yards out. He knocks it through, and Georgia is on the scoreboard. It is seven to three, with seven ten to go after that long 12 play drive. Back with more from Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia. After this, ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Just for Men Hair Color. Stay in the game with Just for Men Hair Color, and Genworth Financial Insurance for Living, Solutions for Life. Just off of Broad Street, downtown Athens, Georgia, a theater downtown showing the game on a big screen for students and fans that don't have tickets to the game. So if you're not one of the lucky 93,000 to gain admission or free in the press box like us, Bob, we got a pretty good seat up here. <laughs> I'll tell you what help, helps fans right now. That sun went down. It was hot here this afternoon, and the sun finally went down. And that is a... Uh, Sticky and hot as it was a week ago for the Oklahoma State game. This is Captain Munnerlin from the five bobbling it. And he's got an alley. Munnerlin on the move. Good straight arm. And Munnerlin up near the 40 yard line. A nice return. Well, uh, we're going to play a little trivia now, folks. And who am I, alumni? Chew on this one for a couple of quarters before we give you the answer. My junior year, I threw game winning touchdown against Auburn to win the Southeastern title. As a senior, I led the SEC in total offense and passing yards. After my collegiate career, played 18 seasons in the league, inducted to both college and pro Hall of Fames. Who am I? I know that one. You start talking about 18 years in the NFL. Yeah, that, right that's, now. that's a big clue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I tell you, I'm impressed with the team speed of South Carolina, Mark. A lot of speed on that field right now. Right now, uh, South Carolina has a speedy freshman in, in Culver. But Mitchell hands it off to his tailback. That is Boyd with a nice burst up the middle for the first down right near midfield as we go to Stan Verrett. All right, guys, Notre Dame and Penn State. We showed you Notre Dame's big return for a touchdown. Penn State striking back. Derek Williams had some problems fielding that punt, but once he got it, he handled his business. 78 yards for the touchdown, and it's a game of big plays so far, one on each side, and Notre Dame and Penn State knotted up at seven in Happy Valley. All right, stand back here after that gain of 11. It's first down. Hand off once again to Boyd. Boyd is running hard and across midfield to the 48 where he's brought down by Marcus Washington. Boyd gaining about three yards on the play. Now, Mark, you talk about Steve Spurrier raising the expectations, raising the bar, saying, yes, South Carolina has the talent level now to compete for an SEC championship. The reason he did that, last year they lost some close games to Florida, Arkansas, Tennessee, Auburn. He wants to put that expectations in the players that they're going to win and they expect to win every week. That's the reason he threw that out there. And I see they have the talent level. 
Got some guys running wild and fast on the field. Davis out of the backfield right near another first down at the 41 yard line. He picked up about seven yards on the play. And, uh, you know, Spurrier said of the players that he has right now, you know, we feel we should compete. And as coaches, we got to weed out the guys that aren't going to play hard and fast. He actually told his team, hey, look at those guys on Florida State and Clemson's teams. Yeah. They had, had the team watch some of the film a few days back during their game and said, we got to be flying around just like them. Yeah, sometimes he'll sting you a little bit <laughs> to motivate you. But sometimes best recruiting <laughs> class in the country, Mark Lass. Last year, an 11 of 22 true freshmen have already played in games, and this guy right here is one of those true freshmen. Yeah, that's Culliver. That's a little pop and shoot play that he had back in Florida back in the day, right? He started that play. The little yep. gator sweep we called that. This was his play, and you're going to see right here Chris Culliver. What a great way to get a young freshman speedster in the game, Mark. I mean, that's as simple a play as there is in football. Right, Just give him the ball. Picked up seven yards. Second down and about three to go. And you see right now that young Georgia defense for the first time this season having to face some adversity, Mark. Yeah, Georgia's defense with just three returning starters from a year ago. Well, we talked about Steve Spurrier, and he did have some issues with the administration regarding the admissions of a couple of players who were not allowed in after meeting NCAA requirements. Here's what he had to say in the aftermath. I got to apologize to two young men that we recruited, and they qualified. They signed with us in February. They were denied admission to our school. And uh, personally, I don't think that's the way you do business. I'm embarrassed that uh, I and our coaches basically misled these young men into believing they were coming here. Now, I'm not blasting the president or the provost. The president's already told me we're gonna change how we do admissions here, but I think we need to get it out to the high school coaches and the players out there that this is not gonna happen again. We'll talk a little bit about that statement after this play, the second down and three, and a first down by Davis with four yards to spare so Bob he had a couple of prize recruits that weren't admitted yeah. as a coach you're left with egg on your face how do you deal with that well first of all it's unfortunate and more than it's unfortunate for Steve Spurrier you could see the passion in his voice it's unfortunate for those two young men because they got publicly humiliated but the bigger point is what was Steve Spurrier told when he accepted the job would if they were NCAA qualified be enough to be admitted and what were those two young men told, Mark, when they made their official visit or committed to South Carolina back in January? So the bigger point, universities can have admittance requirements above and beyond the NCAA limit. That's their choice. It's what was Steve Spurrier told when he accepted the job? And bigger, those two young kids that were humiliated, what were they told? Yeah. Were they told if they met NCAA requirements, they would be admitted? That's really the issue. And subsequent to that statement by Spurrier, the discord between the administration and Spurrier seems to have disappeared. They seem to be on the same page, working towards the same goal right now. Davis on the run, stopped up shy of the 20 by Daniel Ellerby. Stacy Dales reporting a few moments ago that Ellerby on that almost chop block had a slightly injured knee, but obviously okay and able to continue. Mark, as you watch South Carolina's offense, a lot of times you get a misconception about a Steve Spurrier offense. You think that all he wants to do is throw it. You know, in the NFL, he had that tag. You can see that he really wants to be balanced, particularly with a quarterback like Blake Mitchell, who can't go back and throw it 50 or 60 times a game. And now, Bob, they're going to talk it over as South Carolina calls a timeout. Mitchell turned his season around midway through last year and says he feels confident about picking up on that momentum right where he left off. Back with more right after this. Three for South Carolina. A three receiver formation. Mo Brown and Freddie Brown to the top of your screen. Mitchell fumbled it. Oh, he dropped the ball. <laughs> 
They never got out of the starting blocks on that one, and it's fourth down. And you know, one thing to keep in mind, I mean, Blake Mitchell's played a lot of football. I mean, he's 11 and 6 in 17 games to start, but he hasn't played, Mark, since last December in the bowl game. Now, this is his first start, but I mean, Steve Spurrier's seen a lot of things. He's coached a lot of quarterback mechanics. I guarantee he hasn't seen that very often. When the visor comes off, that's when you know that he's really upset. Wow. Ryan suck up in for the field goal attempt. This one coming from oh, about 42, 41 yards out. And he knocks it through. South Carolina taking a seven-point lead after the field goal. But the innovator, the mad scientist of offense, seemingly wanting a little bit more. Back with more after this. The return of Monday Night Football on ESPN September the 10th. The double dip. Starting off at 7 o'clock Eastern, Willis McGay leads the Ravens offense into Cincinnati to take on Carson Palmer and Ocho Cinco. Then after that, it's the 49ers and the Cardinals. You love Chad Johnson, don't you? He's a Miami guy. That's uh, where I'm from. More than that. I mean, <laughs> you love that style of play. I want to see him do that little, that mambo, that, oh, that dance in the end zone. He can't <laughs> give me enough of that. I know you so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd like to see him propose. Propose to one of those cheerleaders to get on the sidelines. You never know what Ocho Cinco is going to do. Boy, kicking off from the 30 this year. Suckup knocks it through the back of the end zone. And let's go back to Stan in the studio. All right, coming up at the half, Jesse Palmer joins me. We're going to talk about the mess at Michigan. Big problems at the Big House once again. Plus, Notre Dame trying to bounce back at Penn State. Yeah, I'll tell you what, you know, with Michigan right now, we expect them to have troubles on defense, but offense, world are hurt right now. Protection issues, their best players are hurt. Lots of problems in Ann Arbor. That plus the nation's longest win streak coming to an end at the half. You know, I, I recruited and coached Jesse Palmer's brother, Billy Palmer, at Notre Dame. What position? Tight end, but I tell you, he was a lot better looking than Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he didn't get a gig on the back row like Jesse did. That pass incomplete. It was a forward pass. Batted down by Travian Robertson. One of the most improved players on that defensive front. And Mark, this South Carolina defense tonight now, they've been unbelievable. I mean, you look, two sacks. Georgia only 56 yards rushing in this football game. Georgia one of seven on third downs and kind of a maligned South Carolina defense after last week against Louisiana Lafayette. Yeah, so what does that say about Louisiana Lafayette's offense? In 252 yards on the ground against the South Carolina crew. On second down, Thomas Brown with a nice move between the tackles out near the 30-yard line, brought down at about the 29. Tackled by Marquis Hall. He got nine on the play. Mark, you talked about last week against ULL. A little bit deceiving because Louisiana Lafayette had a lot of yards with the quarterback running. But you take a look at Tyrone Nix. A lot of pressure on Tyrone Nix. South Carolina's finished ninth in the SEC the last two years in defense. But I'll tell you what, this guy right here is a heck of a football coach. He can handle the pressure. Now his third year on the sidelines at South Carolina. Influences include P.W. Underwood, as well as his former high school coach, Raymond Townsend. Here's Bailey on the run, and Bailey's going to be run down. Bob, you talked about it before. This Gamecock defense has undistilled speed. And Mark, you're right, and Brandon Isaac that time. Of course, he's seen that play so many times in practice because that's Steve Spurrier's play. But he is going to beat a block by the fullback, Sutherland. That's a great open field tackle, but what's Bobo doing stealing the old ball coach's <laughs> plays now? That's the Gator sweep. Yeah, you know what they say about imitation and flattery, I guess. And a timeout called on the play by South Carolina with 1.36 to go here in the first half. So uh, South Carolina might be uh, planning ahead a little bit and trying to get some more points on the board before they go into the locker room. Back to the Aflac trivia question. And we both got this. Three SET teams have never beaten a Steve Spurrier coach team. Name them. That was the other question that I got. Kentucky, Vanderbilt, and Ole Miss. Don't sleep on Kentucky, Vanderbilt, and Ole Miss. Kentucky, great quarterback. Yeah, yeah. 
Rich Brooks got that you, thing Vanderbilt, going a little bit. Vanderbilt has a couple players now. That quarterback who was hurt today a little bit, but also that receiver. And Ole Miss, you know, Eddie Orgeron's done a good job recruiting down there in Oxford. Yeah. Vanderbilt uh, struggling today against Alabama. Interesting guy back here returning this punt, Mark. Captain Munnerlin, the fastest kid on the team for South Carolina. They say he's like a 4 2 guy. Yeah, yeah maybe 4 3 5. I was going on Captain's <laughs> self reported. Wind right <laughs> Brian Mims with his third punt of the afternoon. Carolina should end up with decent field position after the punt. I think they're coming after this new punter for Georgia right here, too. They tried to dial up a little bit of heat. Did they run into him? Yes, there's a flag down on the play as Darian Stewart, number 32 for South Carolina, ran into Mims, the punter. And that's going to result in a first down for Georgia. And Mark, that's three personal foul penalties in the first half against South Carolina. Yeah, I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, it's not a vicious hit, but you have to protect that punter. I mean, there's no reason for that right there. Darian, and Mark, sometimes I have to make this point. When you see all those suspensions mm -hmm. that South Carolina has on this football team coming in, there is a correlation between discipline on the football field and discipline off the field. Make no mistake about that. And what do you think uh, Steve Spurrier thinks about it? He's not liking it too much. One and a half to go here in the first half. New life into this drive for Georgia. The receiver screen incomplete for Bailey. Bailey might have uh, seen some tacklers coming his way. And then Johnson, meanwhile, the starting strong safety for Georgia, leaving the field and heading into the locker room. Maybe a little uh, shaken up. Stacey Dale's down there going to effort a report for us. Meanwhile, Stafford, 8 of 15 passing for 55 yards here in the first half. Second down and 10 coming up. Chris Durham in motion. But the blitz coming and incomplete. The South Carolina defense not afraid to dial up a little heat. Bump. Yeah, and I tell you what, Mike Bobo now getting a little taste of the bluebirds here at Sanford too, Stadium. Huh? You know why? How many screens can you run? <laughs> Last week it was like a screen convention. This week he comes back two plays in a row. They run the little running back screen. They thought they were going to get man-to-man -man coverage. They tried to pick the guy that was covering the running back, but they didn't get it. As Mike Bobo in his first full year in calling the plays. Mark Richt handing over the reins of the offensive play calling to Bobo, the former player here for the Georgia Bulldogs. That young Georgia offensive line, Mark. Got to stay out of third and tens now with the youth they have up front. Stafford has time here. Man coverage and almost intercepted at the 28-yard line. Captain Munnerlin, he of the 4-3 speed. Up on Sean Bailey, and it's incomplete. And, Mark, I talked about this earlier. This is when we find out. And you told me how Sean Bailey loves man-to-man -man coverage. Well, let me tell you, this is man-to-man -man coverage right here. That is not zone. You're allowed to give him a little shove. That's great coverage. Could have been offensive pass interference. Right. But tell me again about that man-to-man. -man. They love it. Sean said he <laughs> loves man-to-man, -man, didn't he? They all light up. Their eyes get big, and they get a... <laughs> Big smile creasing their face, but uh, didn't come up with the result that time. And in once again comes Brian Mims to punt. And I tell you, this South Carolina defense, this is impressive. Impressive tonight because they've tried to hurt themselves as a team with the penalties. A high spiral this time by Mims. Munnellin fields it. It got rocked. It's loose. And Georgia recovers it at the 19. But there's a flag down in the play. So hold on a minute. And wait for the official's call. Mark, remember, there is no halo rule anymore in college football. So once he catches the ball, he's fair game. I'm the kicking team. 
two men shifted without getting reset. Five yard penalty. Repeat wow, fourth down. That's a break for South Carolina. That is a huge break, and South Carolina with no timeouts left in the first half, only a minute and seven, dodged a bullet right there. Going to do it again. One more look. Monolin, he heard footsteps that time. Yeah, and that's totally legal now in college football. You used to have that halo rule where there was, I believe, a, a two-yard circle around the receiver. Now you can be as close as you want just so you don't interfere with the catch. And this time, South Carolina sends Kenny McKinney <laughs> back yeah. to get this punt, Bob. That sure-handed receiver now. <laughs> Not going to take any chances with about a minute seven to go here in the first half. South Carolina, some self-inflicted mistakes, but they've been so good on defense, they've been over to overcome them. You know what? I'd almost take a couple of self-inflicted mistakes if you're going to play with good aggression. Yeah, I think you got a point there. Early in this game, they might have set the tempo. Yep. Fourth down. Towards it to punt again. Mims. That's off another good effort. You don't get away from this one. <laughs> Did he ever? <laughs> He ran away from that like the plague. Downed at the 14 yard line. Well, the night of college football and ESPN continuing with a clash of two of the top 10 teams in the nation. Number nine, Virginia Tech at LSU. Number two, college football primetime presented by Hampton Saturday night on ESPN at 9 15 p.m. Eastern time. I'm Mark Jones. He's Bob Davies. Stacey Dales is down in the field. And uh, Bob, South Carolina trying to snap that five game losing streak against Georgia. A little bit of a surprise at this point, I'd have to say. I think so, but you know, everything flips around. South Carolina really in an enviable position, won the game last week, but didn't play well. Steve Spurrier, the advantage in practice this week. Georgia won last week with a young football team. Maybe starts thinking they're a little better than they really are. And uh, South Carolina with a flag down in the field. Steve Spurrier and Tyrone Nix, the brain trust of the offense and defense, uh, talked about execution to their respective units, and especially the defense. Uh, Nix telling us in our conference call that they concentrated a lot on tackling. They needed to do a better job of tackling. It sounds trite, sounds like a cliche, but so far that has been one of the differences in the game for South Carolina. And don't underestimate Steve Spurrier coming out this Billy week. Shift. Offense 85. And talking about how he watched the Clemson Florida State game Monday night and how great those two defensive <laughs> teams were and how hard those players played and how well they coached. Don't think for a second Tyrone Nix and South Carolina's defense didn't take that personal. That's like somebody telling you how great your ex girlfriend was. Yeah, huh? Or somebody <laughs> telling you what a great play by play guy, you know, someone else is. I mean. <laughs> Up seven points, South Carolina trying to snap that losing streak against Georgia in the 60th edition of the rivalry between these two teams. That was Corey Boyd over the left side. Boyd out of Orange, New Jersey has overcome a lot of difficult and trying circumstances during his football career and even to make it this far, but that'll in all effect right now be the last play of the first half. You know, Mark, those Georgia coaches told us they took the tape from last week and they said, you know what, guys, we really didn't play all that well. They went out in pads on Monday to set the tempo, but sometimes players don't believe it. Right. Let's go downstairs to Stacy. Coach Spurrier, we know you guys have worked on being a more aggressive team. Three personal foul penalties. What's your reaction to those? Yeah. Well, nobody in the stadium saw him, but uh, yeah, one of our mouths, uh, players got a little mouthy and he pushed him out of bounds. But uh, yeah, we're not playing real smart, but they only got three points. Our defense is playing well, and we got to keep it up. We'll have a chance. Yeah, how is your defense managed to pressure the quarterback, they're but also apply well. coverage? Yeah, they're just covering everybody and stopping the run. All right, thanks, Coach. Give us a chance. Thanks, Coach. Mark he tells the truth, Stacy, and if the truth hurts, you'll be in the pain. <laughs> you will be in pain. Last week, Stan Veretti called them average stiffs. Stan, right now they're looking like above average stiffs. <laughs> Maybe the coach might say that. Back to you. All right, Mark. Thanks a lot. Florida State looking like some stiffs as well. Taking on UAB. Drew Weatherford picked off by Will Dunbar. 
And Dunbar's taking it to the house. UAB leading Florida State 17-10 right now. Florida State hoping to bounce back from last week's loss to Clemson to open the season, but so far, no luck for Bobby Bowden and company. I'm Stan Verrett along with Jesse Palmer. Welcome to the Halftime Report. Notre Dame also hoping to bounce back. Their offense absolutely dreadful last week in that season opening loss to Georgia Tech. Their worst opening of a season ever in history. Trying to rebound against Penn State. Charlie Weiss turned into Jimmy Clausen. Penn State turned into Anthony Morelli, but he threw it up and yeah, Irish quarterback Darren Walls with the pick, and Walls with some great block in it. It looks like a punt return. It looks like he has the whole wall set up for him on the left-hand side. What a return by Darren Walls. And the Irish with a 7 nothing lead, so the defense helping out puts the points on the board. But then here comes Derek Williams. Everybody talks about Deshaun Jackson out on the West Coast, but I'll tell you what, this guy plays receiver. He can also return kicks. Shows you his ability to make guys miss. That Zipikowski just made miss pretty badly for a nice touchdown return for Penn State. All right, so two big plays and two touchdowns on the board, but Penn State will come back. Morelli settling down to Jordan Norwood, who gets in for the touchdown. The Nittany Lions with a 14-7 lead right now as they head towards the half. Chad Henney in Michigan also trying to bounce back. They were upset, of course, last week by Appalachian State. First quarter, Oregon down 7-3. Dennis Dixon going up top for Brian Pacinger. What's going on with the Michigan defense? I'll tell you what, they're just having a hard time playing in space, but give a lot of credit to Dennis Dixon. He's a guy who everyone said was a running quarterback that could throw the football a little bit. He proved in this football game it's exactly the opposite. He made three of the nicest throws I've ever seen. And then second quarter, Dixon with the Statue of Liberty play to Jonathan Stewart. And look at Stewart go. Just the physical running. Michigan's had problem tackling people the last two weeks. Jonathan Stewart proves it right there, just bruising his way along. All right, so they run the Statue of Liberty play, and then they fake the Statue of Liberty play, and Dixon keeps it himself, and it's shades of Romani Edwards from last week. 39-7, Oregon over Michigan, and they just can't believe it in Ann Arbor. Maybe what we're finding out, Jesse, is that Michigan's really just not that good. Well, I'll tell you what, I think we all expected the Michigan defense to have problems against this option offense again, but we all expected at least this offense to make plays. And you look at the game today, in the first half, 28 snaps inside Oregon territory. They only come away with seven points. And whether it's throwing an interception in the end zone or fumbling, they can't afford to make these types of mistakes. Now, Chad Henney goes down, gets hurt. Mike Hart re-aggravates a thigh injury. They're going to have problems coming back from that. But listen, Ryan Mao, the backup quarterback, comes in the game, and they can't protect anybody. Whether it's Chad Henney or Ryan Mallett, they have the most fundamental problems right now offensively just protecting the quarterback. In this preseason, we talked about Jake Long, Mario Manningham, Mike Hart, Chad Henney, and how explosive this team could be. And today, we didn't see that at all. Yeah, we wondered how Michigan would respond to that shocking upset at the hands of Appalachian State. The response they didn't want was their worst home loss in 40 years, which is what they got today. What about Oklahoma? Last week they put 79 on North Texas, but I know what you're saying. That was North Texas. Well, what about taking on Miami today? Wait till you see what the Sooners did to the Hurricanes in Norman. On Sunday NFL Countdown, we kick off with lots. Jets head coach Eric Mangini showed some range this offseason. Whether it was a cameo on Sesame Street or The Sopranos, we'll profile the man behind Mangenius. Ladanian Tomlinson climbed into the record books in 2006. Emmett Smith finds out about the unique training regimen that's preparing LT for the season. And Kenny Mayne visits Seattle to find out how a slip and slide helps the Seahawks quarterbacks at practice. That's all ahead on Sunday NFL Countdown, 11 a.m. Eastern. Now let's send it to Mike Tirico and the Monday Night Football crew. Chris, thanks. We opened the Monday night season with a doubleheader in the first game matches the last two champs of the AFC North. And if you look at key offseason acquisitions, maybe the biggest in this division was Baltimore getting Willis McGahee via trade from Buffalo. The running back could make a difference. Uh, he will make a difference. When you look at his Ravens offense, I call it a blacksmith style of offense. They love to hammer the football in the running game between the tackles. In fact, last season, they went outside only 10% of the time. That's the fewest running plays to the outside of any team in the National Football League. Willis McGee now gives him that quickness to get to the outside. Ravens won 13 games, try to upgrade their offense with a couple of teams that, I guess, opposites attract. Oh, yes. We English majors like to say this is a game fraught with irony. Brian Billick, when he got the job at Baltimore, came with a reputation as an offensive genius. He's really never had much of an offense. His defense has been great because it was built there by Marvin Lewis, who then left to go to Cincinnati with a reputation as a defensive genius. His defense has never been great. Go figure. Yeah, talk about must-see TV. Chad Johnson and Ray Lewis on the field. Oh. 
the same yeah. time when the Bengals have the ball. See at 7 Eastern. Note the start time Monday night. Fresno State tied the game with Texas A&M with four seconds to go in regulation. Now they have taken the lead on the Aggies in the second overtime. We'll bring you the final as soon as that one is over here at ESPN2. In the meantime, second half of our game coming up. Matthew Stafford had plenty of South Carolina company in the Georgia backfield. Gamecocks with a 10-3 lead. Second half from Athens on the way in just a minute. Huge game because it's obviously a Southeastern Conference game, but it's an SEC East game, and you only play five of those. But right now, with this young Georgia team, things went so well last week against Oklahoma State, went according to script. Tonight, not that way against South Carolina. Who's going to step up in a leadership role for Georgia? Because right now, South Carolina is taking it to them in this football game, particularly South Carolina's defense. As many as 18 Bulldog freshmen and redshirt freshmen making their SEC debut. Munnerlyn dropped it and picked it up. That sometimes can mean there's going to be a good kickoff return. He gets this one all the way out to the 24-yard line as we go down to Stacy. Now, Mark, I just spoke with Georgia coach Mark Richt. He was not happy with his team. He said, we're not wrapping up defensively. We're not tackling. We're not blocking. Bottom line, Stacy, we look like we don't want it as much as the opposition. That's got to change. And the other bad news for this Georgia team, wide receiver, backup wide receiver, A.J. Bryant, will not return. He's got a knee injury. And here's the big one, guys. The leader of the defense, Keelan Johnson, will not return with a rib injury. Uh, Keelan Johnson is the leader of that defense. And uh, we saw him, Bob, miss a tackle, which led to a South Carolina touchdown, one of the few miscues for him on the season. First down and 10 for Mitchell, who hands it off to Corey Boyd. Boyd might have lost a yard on the play, brought down by Jeff Owens. Let's look at our ESPN2 game track. Boyd with six rushes for 38 yards and a touchdown. He had two touchdowns last week against Louisiana Lafayette. And the South Carolina Gamecock defense, really the big story of that first half, able to slow down and read things well against Georgia. Well, Mark, it's just they're playing so hard. They played harder than Georgia played in the first half. So maybe Steve Spurrier early in the week when he stung him with some criticism. Maybe he had a plan. Mitchell put it on the ground and the Gamecocks fortunate to get it back. The recovery made on the play by South Carolina's Meredith. Tamon Meredith up front but Roderick Battle applying the pressure along with Weston up front for Georgia. Yeah and you see Mark Rick right now getting this crowd into it. Georgia so good up front. Big 91 Weston is a giant in there. Also the speed of Roderick Battle. Blake Mitchell Bob twice now has been a little bit careless negligent with that football putting it on the ground. That time though they were fortunate to get it back. They lost five on the play. Welcome to the SEC football right here. This place is rocking. On third and long, Mitchell gets it off. And Boyd with nowhere to go but down at the 20. It's three and out. Marcus Howard there to apply the stop along with Thomas Flowers. And as you know, in this league, the Southeastern Conference, and for this football team, specifically Georgia, it's going to start on defense. And that great opening series right there by the Georgia defense. Charles Johnson and Quentin Moses, a couple of guys for Georgia who have moved on to the NFL. And the guys up front, including Marcus Howard, trying to fill those large shoes. Mark, this is a good punt return man right here, Mikey Henderson. Henderson to the 33. Giving up a little bit of ground and brought down. Good coverage by the Gamecocks at the 31-yard line. A 47-yard punt. Minus two on the return. And here's what Mark Richt had to say about this brewing rivalry. We're so close. You know, in proximity, we recruit a lot of the same guys. It's, it's a little bit like getting in a fist fight with your with your brother once a year, you know, and uh, wanting to win because you got to you got to live with that for a whole year. <laughs> That's a pretty good analogy. <laughs> you know what? There's 17 scholarship players on South Carolina's roster from Georgia. 
only five Georgia players from South Carolina. It looks a little bit more important to these South Carolina players so far. But look out. Stafford had his man open and overthrew his receiver on the play Marino. No Sean Marino was wide open ticketed for six. Instead, they'll end up with a second down and 10. Mark, when you play man to man, you're going to get a linebacker on a running back, and Georgia tried to exploit it on first down. They actually tried to pick Casper Brinkley. Great design on the play call. Matt Stafford just lay it up there. That was a great call, Mark. They had the coverage right on. You talk about a mismatch. Watching Brinkley trying to keep up with no Sean Marino. And here's Marino again on the run this time. Brought down by Stewart, but a nice gain by the redshirt freshman of seven yards on the play. Last week, remember, he had 121 total yards of their 376 on offense. We haven't talked about uh, Matthew Stafford much tonight. Uh, a little bit cold there in the first half, passing the Bob, ball, Bob. Just uh, 8 of 17. Yeah, Georgia, 1 of 9, Mark on third downs in the first half. This is a manageable third and four right here. But South Carolina has taken away the short passes and the screens that Georgia lived with last week. See what they do here on third and three. The pass is batted up and incomplete at the 40-yard line. South Carolina's defense once again equal to the task it was intended for Chris Durham. And broken up by Stewart and on another play for the game top. Mark, they are challenging these receivers. It's man-to-man -man coverage. You watch Darian Stewart right there on the wide receiver, Chris Durham. I'll tell you, that's good, tight coverage. Tell me again how those Georgia receivers yeah. told you they love man-to-man -man coverage. Maybe not as much after <laughs> this game, Bob. It's the fourth punt of the afternoon for Brian Mims. This Captain Munderland is kind of high risk, high reward back there returning for South Carolina. <laughs> Seen a lot of the high risk part yeah. so far. Mims with a spiral, low line drive type of kick, returnable at the 20. And Munderland brought down at the 25 yard line, got five on the punt return after the 43 yard punt. Each team beginning the second half with a three and out. Back with more after this. This ESPN2 telecast is available in a brilliant high definition on ESPN2 HD, presented by Pioneer Kuro. Back at the sold-out Sanford Stadium, this crowd, which right now is pretty raucous, has been silenced for most of the day. South Carolina leading by seven, first down and ten for the Gamecocks. Mitchell completes this pass to McKinley and makes a nice move for the first down. Let's go back to our Who Am I alumni question and read it through carefully. You only get one shot. I only repeat it once. In my junior year, I threw the game-winning touchdown against Auburn to win the Southeastern title. As a senior, I led the SEC total offense, passing yards. After my career, oh, it was Fran Tarkenton. That was pretty easy. I got that one. <laughs> They're just breaking me in slowly this year in the truck. After going 0 for 13 last year, a 12 yard pickup. And Mitchell back to pass again. They set up a little middle screen to Boyd, who's tackled just shy of the 40 yard line by Ellerby. But let's talk about uh, Blake Mitchell a little bit. Uh, a little bit underwhelming in the first half? I think so. You know, I thought he would play better, to be honest. Keep in mind, this is a guy from the state of Georgia. First football game he's played since December because he was suspended last week for the opener. Hasn't played a lot, but all of a sudden it looks like he's settled down just a little bit on these last two throws. This is their second possession of the second half. Hands it off to Boyd, and Boyd with a nice run over that left side of the offensive line. Running over William Brown, Garrett Anderson, and Jamon Meredith. And Boyd There's with a nice a, gain. Mark, and that is a signature play in the Steve Spurrier offense. The sprint draw where all those linemen set pass. You have the lead blocker, the fullback coming through, getting the block. Take a look right here. You're going to see those linemen right here, Mark. They're all setting pass, but you have the fullback come through on the lead blocker on the linebacker. 
again took advantage of a numbers situation right there. Georgia really trying to defend pass right there. Got caught. And to bring in the chains and uh, measure. Talked about Mitchell and uh, that run good enough for the first down and turned his season around late last year. Actually completed 69% of his passes with 10 touchdown passes in his last, well, four and a half games. His brother, interestingly enough, his older brother uh, played basketball for Bobby Knight at Texas Tech after earlier uh, discarding his minor league baseball career. You know, he showed some signs of brilliance, really, in his career in South Carolina. Just has been inconsistent. And maybe I should uh, reconsider that underwhelming statement that I made a few moments ago. He's hit nine of his last ten passes, and he slides in safely at the 47-yard line. Got about six on the play. Good pressure up front by Geno Atkins. You know, Mark, he started 11 games in 05, Blake Mitchell. Started six last year. Really was benched after the Georgia game last year. Then came back and finished the season pretty strong. So, like this South Carolina team, the reason Steve Spurrier raised the bar, they finished strong. I think they've won four straight games now, South Carolina. Finished up eight and five a season ago, won their bowl game. Brian Maddox, the true freshman in the tailback, and he was swamped immediately up front by Weston. Maddox, an interesting story. He was on our uh, ESPNU show, yeah. the Summer House. I tell you, Steve, uh, excuse me, Chris Spielman <laughs> got after him. Roughed him up a little got bit. Got his mind right now. <laughs> I mean, Chris takes those guys like it's boot camp on that Summer House show now. He gets them ready for college football. Well, Maddox didn't get any yards, but Spielman telling me earlier this week that uh, Maddox always ready and very willing to please and predicted big things for the true freshman. Albeit losing four yards on that carry. Keep an eye on Marcus Howard coming off that corner now. Third down and nine coming up. Mitchell, incomplete drop by McKinley. Could have, maybe should have caught that. Prince Miller in on the cover. Prince Miller, a young guy from South Carolina, number 23. That was great coverage right there. Well thrown football. You know the thing that Prince Miller did a great job of, even though the ball probably should have been caught much, he never looked back to the ball because he was beat or out of phase with the receiver. He tried to catch up with the receiver. That was a heck of a throw right there by Blake Mitchell. Put it right where it needed to be. Suck up into punch, standing at his own 35. Mikey Henderson. At the 13 for the Georgia Bulldogs. Got a couple of great names in this. Uh, got a Prince Miller and a Captain Munnerlin. What happened to those Mark Jones kind of names? I know. Huh? And an ordinary Mikey I making know. the fair catch, exactly. huh? Boy, give us a little more. We'll be back with more right after this break. Outside. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Dodds. Live life to the fullest. Dodds, grab life. Stanford right back in our ESPN2 studios with your primetime pulse. Penn State with a 17-7 lead on Notre Dame over on ESPN. And on ABC, the final race before the chase for the championship, the Chevy Rock and Roll 400 from Richmond, Mark Young. And speaking of rock and roll, Marino across midfield and down to the 41-yard line on the explosive burst. A 49-yard gallop by the redshirt freshman, no Sean Marino. And Mark, I'll tell you what, he gets an excellent block right here. But the cutback, and watch this move right here in the open field on Brandon Isaac. This kid right here, you can see why they're starting to compare him to a mini Herschel Walker right here. That's a great compliment, and look at that accompanying talent. That hurdle move was pretty slick by the second all-time leading rusher in New Jersey State high school history. Mark, that was a great effort by 32. Darian Stewart from South Carolina to track him down, but that's why you have to have patience with the running game 
if you're Georgia, when you have a tailback like 24 back there, eventually, eventually he'll get it. Yeah. Talked about his total yardage last week, amassed 121 total yards as Isaac favoring that left leg of his for South Carolina. Wow, there's a look at where it happened. Moreno ran right by him. Brandon Isaac, the six foot two inch, 200 pound senior. Mark, you see it all the time as a coach. No, Sean Marino is one of those guys. The first time you see him touch it in practice, you know he has that yeah. it factor or whatever it is. I mean, these fans, every time he touches the ball in the stadium, they gasp. They expect something good to happen. As they say in popular culture, Bob, uh, Marino is now. He's now. <laughs> A career long run for him. Thomas Brown, the starting tailback in the ballgame, and Craig Lumpkin last week against Oklahoma State fractured his thumb. He's out between two and four weeks. And this is Marino again, the redshirt freshman. And you know what, Bob? It just might clarify the tailback situation when Lumpkin has to sit out now for a few weeks. There he is on the sidelines, shook his hand before the game, and he had a major league cast on that right thumb. Well, one thing, it. yeah, Lumpkin with the thumb. One thing in this league, you better have several healthy tailbacks, particularly when you have kind of the undersized tailbacks like Noshawn Marino and Thomas Brown. I mean, they're going to take a pounding if you can touch this guy. Yeah. Lumpkin hopeful to be back in the next four weeks. Marino in motion. This is Sutherland. Got about two yards. Still about three yards shy of the first down. Brennan Sutherland, the six foot junior. Brought down by Norwood on the play. One of the storylines coming into the game for South Carolina was how would its defense respond after giving up a lot of yardage on the ground against University of Louisiana, Louisiana Lafayette. And boy, just Georgia, no success, Mark, on third downs. You wonder if this is four down territory and Mark Rick doesn't run the football here to try to make it fourth and really short and then go for it. Thomas Brown now, Bob, coming into the ball game. A two of 14 on third down, a two tight end formation. And they give it to Brown, and he's got stopped up short of the first down, tripped up nicely by Jasper Brinkley. One of the two twins. Mark, we talked about Mark Rick, who is now the CEO, not calling the plays. He made the decision prior to that snap that he was going to go for it on fourth down. What tells you that? Because he ran the ball on third and about four, trying to get it to about fourth and one. So he knew he was going to have four downs. But all of a sudden now, this is not quite as manageable a fourth down as he thought. It's a long two, a little... Play fake by Stafford. He couldn't sell it. Nobody was buying, and Norwood sacks him at midfield. Matthew Stafford tried to pull a little okie doke, but Herrick Norwood would have none of it. Mark, what happens when you play man to man coverage? You're going to look up here at the top. It's man to man coverage right here with Carlos Thomas. So all this play action fake doesn't mean anything. Look, he's just sitting up there playing man to man, so he didn't bite the cheese, as we like to say. <laughs> that play action didn't mean anything to him. He's out there man to man on the wide receiver. And a huge show of intransigence and fortitude by that defense for South Carolina. First down and 10 right around midfield. I said bite the cheese. You kind of understood it. I like I that. understand what intransigence is. <laughs> they wouldn't move. They didn't give an inch. The pass complete at the 22. And the offense now on the move. Kenny McKinley with the catch. And the Gamecocks are fired up. The toughest throw to defend, Mark, is the underthrown deep ball. Little double move. But right here, you look, Kenny McKinley is looking back to the football. Brian Evans is not looking back to the football. Also, a little tug on the jersey right there. But Steve Spurrier back with a little double move. Bob, we may look back at that fourth down stop by the defense as a pivotal point in this ball game when it's all said and done. Davis is the lone back. First and ten. Mitchell 
into coverage and incomplete intended for McKinley. And it's second down and 10. Thomas Flowers in on the coverage. Mark, you go back to that fourth down call. What happened? South Carolina played great run defense on third down, which made it a fourth and longer. Sometimes when those kind of calls work, you think they're great calls, but I don't think that was a great call that hide the ball, try to get play action, because it was man-to-man -man coverage. That didn't affect anyone. Yeah. As a result, South Carolina looking at second and 10 now from the 23-yard line of Georgia. Mitchell with a check. Fires a dart, and it's going to be ruled complete. Incomplete now at the 19-yard line for Mo Brown. Brown insisted that he came up with it, and one of the officials from the far side came in, and now they're going to discuss it. Well, they'll get a chance. As you know, every play is reviewable. Or, excuse me. Every play is reviewed in college football. Mo Brown was displaced by Freddie Brown in the starting lineup this week. And this play is officially under review as the. I'm going to give it to him. That's a catch. You think that there was indisputable evidence that that ball did not touch the ground? Not from that angle, but from the yeah. previous one. I thought he had his hands underneath the rock. That's too close for me to call. Let's look again here. You know, Mark, I think the point of that ball you think so? touched that blade of grass. But the point, as you know, the indisputable yeah. evidence, I don't think that's the return that call, yeah. Let's play under review, and uh, if it doesn't stand, the ball will go back to the 23-yard line again. It'll be third down and 10 to go for Blake Mitchell in that South Carolina offense. South Carolina looking for big things this year in the big picture in the SEC. Steve Spurrier, their head coach, said on media day that this is the season they can make a move. And one more look. I say catch. Yeah, I think you just have to go with the call on the field, though, because... That was a that good effort by Mo Brown. Sure enough effort. You're right, that was a good effort by Mo. Mo Brown, like I said, was replaced in the starting lineup by Freddie Brown this week. Still waiting as this play is being reviewed in the booth. I mean, you have to love replay in college football because so much at stake. I mean, you walk through Athens, Georgia today, <laughs> you see how much is at stake in this stadium tonight under the lights, don't yeah, you? Certainly do. Bob, every home game here at Sanford Stadium has been sold out this year. So you want to get the call right. But I think one of the negatives is how long it takes. I mean, who knows? But I don't think this is a game-changing call right now. Let's make a decision and roll with it, right? Yeah, we would have gained, uh, what, if, if it's ruled a catch, they would have gained about four or five yards on the play. Mo Brown, the intended receiver. The ruling on the field is reversed. The receiver did get his hands under the ball. The ball will be spotted at the 17-and-a-half-yard line. Third down. You were right, Mark. Wow. So that moves the ball uh, just around like the seven, 17 and a half, about five yards to go. How much does that change the play call now if you're South Carolina, third and 10 versus third and five? A little more man. Yeah, I it? think it does, Mark. I think all of a sudden the guy like the big tight end, number 84, Jared Cook, right here at the top, comes into play a little bit more on third and five. A three receiver formation. Mitchell, a quick three step drop. Goes back to Brown this time. No disputing that. It's incomplete. I look like a catchable pass. Yeah, Mark. Or third and five, Mark. It looks like a sure first down conversion right there. Just a little slant right oh, there. Oh, boy. I mean, the old case of taking your eyes off the football to look downfield. Would have kept the drive alive. Instead, Ryan Suckup comes into the ball game to attempt his second field goal of the game. He hit earlier from 41 yards out. This one comes from 35 yards out. For a 10-point lead. Ryan Suckup 
further quieting, silencing the sellout crowd here at Sanford Stadium. But what could have been had Mo Brown hung on to that pass? South Carolina with an upset brewing here in Athens under the lights. Season, huh? I'm putting Virtual Walker right up there at the top now. Virtual Walker. It's got to be somebody that won the Heisman, you think. Out of the end zone. Thomas Brown. And Brown takes it out to the 24 yard line. We go downstairs to Stacy. Yeah, Mark, just something we really need to keep our eye on. South Carolina starting free safety, Brendan Isaac, just returned from the locker room. He had his right shoulder brace. You see the black brace just coming out of his pads. He is likely to return in this game, guys, but he will be critical starting free safety again. And you know Stafford itching to get the ball downfield, Mark. Yeah, good point. Uh, this Georgia offense so prolific a week ago against Oklahoma State, putting 35 points on the board this week with just a single field goal to show after almost three quarters. First down and 10, Stafford with another play fake. Wide open in the middle of the field, complete to Trip Chandler. And it's first and 10. Chandler with his first game of the season after missing last week. Mark, this all starts with the block. Watch, no Sean, the tailback, the freshman tailback on the block on the safety. Not many freshmen protect like that. Now, Trip Chandler, who did not play last week at tight end, has time to get down the seam and make the big catch. But how about Noshan, the big block for the freshman? You don't see that many times, Mark. Is that usually why freshman tailbacks and redshirt friendship, freshman tailbacks end up sitting in favor of upperclassmen pass protection? Exactly right. Particularly Thomas Brown, the other tailback, they say is maybe the best pass protector on the team. But that was a heck of a job right there. You know, contributing in other ways. Meanwhile, that's Captain Munnerlin hopping off the field for South Carolina. He's their starting quarterback. Mike West is his backup. A 23-yard pickup, first down and 10, Georgia near midfield. Trailing by 10 points, Georgia's won five consecutive games against their rivals from just three hours away. Stafford. Throws another dart, completed the 30-yard line. This one to Durham. And Stafford is throwing that ball with real serious intent. A 22-yard pickup. And Mark, that was a great read against zone coverage. That time South Carolina goes zone. You look right here, you see the linebacker 44 kind of gets pulled out of his zone. They throw the ball in behind him. Andrew Stafford, a true sophomore, highly recruited out of the Dallas area. Made it early to Georgia a couple of years ago. Here he is handing it off to Marino. That time stopped up. Right near the line of scrimmage. Mark, you talk about Matt Stafford again, you know, and they've gone back, and Mark Rick has taken a little bit of heat because he said he has to clarify that Matt's Matt uh, Safford is the most talented quarterback he's ever coached. Now, keep in mind, Mark Rick knows what he's talking about. He's coached two Heismans. He's coached 11 NFL quarterbacks. Plus, he was in camp with John Elway, Mark Rick, when he was a free agent at Denver. So, I take Mark Rick's word for it. This guy's talented. Certainly has the background and the credentials. Here's Marino improving his resume by the carry. That time, chopped down nicely. Got a good lead block from Brennan Sutherland, but a nice defensive play made by Casper Brinkley. Watch right here, the middle linebacker, Jasper Brinkley, Mark. This guy is an NFL player at about 255 pounds. He'll be a great 3-4 linebacker because he's big enough to get up and play over those guards like they do in the NFL in those schemes. A 6-2 senior, all SEC a season ago. He is the older, actually younger of the Twins by a couple of minutes. Stafford downfield, incomplete at the two-yard line. In and out of the arms of Moore. Mark, this was a poor read by Matt Stafford. I want you to watch. The tight end right here is going to come across the field. South Carolina is in man-to-man -man coverage. They turn the tight end completely loose. Look right here as we freeze this. He is wide open, short touchdown, and he went for the deeper throw. 
And as a result, it's field goal time for Brandon Patu. This one coming from 44 yards out. Patu, an all SEC selection, knocks it through. And he's now two of three on the night. But what could have been had Moore been able to hang on to that pass. Well, folks, don't miss the return of Monday Night Football on ESPN September 10th. A double dip coming your way first at 7 o'clock Eastern. Willis McGahee leads the Ravens offense into Cincinnati to take on Carson Palmer, Chad Johnson, a.k.a. Ochocinco, and the Bengals. Then at 10-15 Eastern, Matt Leiner to the Cardinals look to move the chains against the San Francisco 49ers. Chad Johnson talking about uh, Baltimore uh, having to miss church on Sunday because of the Monday night game. That means I'll be in trouble. But a look at some of the prevailing storylines. Boy, the Colts' defense looked really impressive, didn't they, a couple nights oh, I'll ago? I'll tell you what, they did. A lot of speed on that defense. And when they get ahead in the game, it plays right into their hands because they're kind of an undersized speed defense. But I'm anxious to watch Bobby Petrino. You know, a guy that had a great scheme in college football. And you look at Steve Spurrier tonight on the other sideline, not many college guys have gone to the NFL and been successful. I'm really anxious to see Bobby Petrino go up there. And you know what? The odds are against him right now because he lost his quarterback. Yeah. yeah ask, uh, ask Nick Saban of Alabama about going to the NFL. Things not exactly working out for him with the Miami Dolphins. Well, you live down there in Miami. Well, they called him exactly many tears when he left the state of Florida. They, they threw him a parade. Gotcha. And sent him a vehicle. Yeah. Sent him a limo. There was a mass feeling of alienation, albeit some of his players on the Dolphins received uh, some good luck cards and letters from Nick Saban in the last couple of days wishing him good luck this season. Nobody said he had any good public relations. <laughs> exactly. Chris Culliver on the return. That's a good point. And South Carolina is going to start off from its own 26-yard line, leading this ball game 13 to 6, with 1:48 to go here in the third quarter of play at Sanford Stadium. I'm Mark Jones, along with Bob Davey and Stacy Dales, down in the field. Blake Mitchell playing his first game of the 2007 season after serving a one-game suspension last week, not playing against Louisiana Lafayette because he did not attend enough classes during summer session. Notre Dame threatening now up at Penn State. Had a one touchdown game. And Mitchell hands it off. Boyd makes it just out to the 25 yard line. I was listening to Coach Lou Holtz a little while ago talking about his recruitment of Corey Boyd. Holtz, of course, the predecessor to Spurrier here at South Carolina, and he was really gushing. Uh, about Corey Boyd and some of the obstacles he's had to overcome coming out of Orange, New Jersey. And sometimes we trivialize and make it sound trite when guys overcome dire circumstances in their environments. But this really is a success story, the fact that he has made it this far in football and in life. Mike Davis and Boyd now in the backfield. This is Davis on the little swing pass. And Davis makes it to the 30-yard line, picked up about five on the play. And what you love about Corey Boyd, you know, he was suspended two years ago, missed the entire season. And a lot of times, guys that come out of a background where maybe they didn't get what the other guys got, they tend to cave in a little bit. But Corey Boyd has that special little thing, Mark, that brought him back. And you hope this guy, he's an NFL prospect without any doubt. Showing some skills today. Third down and six coming up. Boyd trying to make a move and nowhere to go. It'll be fourth down coming up. Mark, was that Steve Spurrier that just called that little running play on third down and about six or wow. seven right there? I'm not sure that his players gave him what he wanted or what exactly he was looking for. Yeah, I'm not sure that wasn't some kind of check at the line of scrimmage right here. Bob, I get the feeling that he's kind of hard on his quarterbacks. But then again, when you have a Heisman Trophy at home on the mantelpiece, it affords you the opportunity to be extremely critical of the guys taking the snaps. Yeah, and if you're a quarterback, you'd love to play for Steve Spurrier, wouldn't you?
I don't think you can measure the gravity of a potential win here for Steve Spurrier's South Carolina Gamecock team should they come out of Sanford Stadium with a win. Going into the fourth period now, they lead 13 to 6. Mikey Henderson back deep for Jordan to accept his punt at his own 28. And Suckup with a high punt that comes down at the 37 yard line. Well, Mark Richt used to be one of the coaches that called the plays as a head coach, but no longer since giving the reins of the offense to Mike Bobo. Here's a list of the coaches that still do call their own plays. Not always a, an easy job, Bob. And uh, Mark Richt, uh, we met with him recently, and he told us that now he likes to have a bigger picture of things. He said that during the offseason, he had a chance to speak with various CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, and the most important thing that he learned was to trust his instincts. See what Mike Bobo calls here on first down and 10. Marino can't hang on to it, and they're going to lose a bunch of yards here back to the 22. Eric Norwood there to make the stop. Boy, Mark, that's disappointing right there. You talk about self-inflicted mistakes. But you talk about the head coach calling the plays. You know, some guys function better as a CEO. Other guys function better when they're right in the middle of it. I like to call the plays because I think the players get to see your personality and actually get to see you coach on the field. So this guy right here, he said when he, if he has to become a CEO, He'll retire first. I mean, he loves calling the plays. And that enthusiasm rubs off on everyone. Interesting point. A loss of 14. Second and 23 to go. Stafford incomplete and had his receiver open, Muhammad Massacor. Poor Mark. He was wide open on that corner route. Remember last week against Oklahoma State, he threw the same route to Sean Bailey and threaded it. You take a look at this corner route. I mean, he is wide open right now. Just lay the ball on his outside shoulder. But you know what, Mark? This week, there's adversity. Mm -hmm. And that play before that Noshaw Marino dropped the pitch affected that play right there and that throw by Matt Stafford. And Mike Bobo's play calling falling under a little bit more scrutiny now with his team trailing by seven points. He actually started calling the plays in the third last game of last season. Stafford with a little room to move. And what a catch by Massacor. First down, Georgia after picking up 26. Boy, and Matt Stafford using his legs to keep the play alive. But how about Mohamed Massacor, Mark? Booed last year. Booed in Sanford Stadium at home because he dropped some balls. Comes back and makes a big time catch right here. That's pretty. Went into traffic and came down with it. A huge conversion for the Bulldogs out near midfield now. You know, and Stacy talked about those wide receivers blocking, improving their toughness. You see that right there. That was a tough catch. Here's Henderson in motion. Play fake. Man open downfield, and it hung up there a little bit too long. Incomplete intended for Trip Chandler. Brandon Isaac back there to knock it down. Isaac was shaken up a little bit earlier in the game. Mark, you're going to see the play action pass. Watch the tight end, Trip Chandler, go down the field. He's going to run by the corner, but the ball is late. Right now, he is wide open, but Stafford takes too much time, allows the safety to come from the middle of the field. Kind of hung it up there a little bit. Sets up a second down and 10. Boy, Chandler really making his presence felt. And kind of like the way that Stafford is trying to sell those ball fakes. Chandler in motion. Marino. Hit from the middle linebacker, Jasper Brinkley. Mark, let me make one more point. We talked about the CEO or be the offensive coordinator. One problem, and I know this from having coached the defense, is when the head coach is the offensive coordinator like Steve Spurrier, sometimes the defense gets overshadowed a little bit, gets a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. You feel second rate? You really do. But I think Tyrone Nixon, this defense, has used that to their advantage tonight. Huh. You know, Steve Spurrier was on him a little bit after the game last week. I think they've used that as tremendous motivation. Yeah, they certainly have performed today, Bob. 
yielding just six points to an offense last week in Georgia that put 35 up on the board against Oklahoma State. It's Matt Stafford's move now, and the guy upstairs, Mike Bobo. Tyro Nix looking to make his. Back at Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia, I'm Mark Jones, along with Bob Davey and Stacey Dales. Jasper Brinkley, a pivotal part of that South Carolina defense, getting a breather on the sideline. Third down and nine coming up for the Bulldogs. They haven't done well on third down conversion. Stafford incomplete at the 37-yard line intended for Bailey. Woodson in on the coverage, and it's fourth down. In comes the punt team. Mark, I love South Carolina. They're just going to line up and say, okay, we're playing man-to-man -man coverage. See if you can beat us. I mean, they're just saying, here we are. Come get us. And there is not much room right there to throw that football. I think a great plan tonight by Tyrone Nix challenging these Georgia receivers. Certainly did, and uh, Nix talked about Better tackling this week for his defensive unit. Looking for the 40, it's Brian Mims and McKinley back for South Carolina. Georgia unable to down this one. And it will come back out to the 20-yard line. A 50-yard punt, nothing on the return. I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey and Stacey Dales under the lights in Stanford State, Sanford Stadium. Athens, Georgia. This is the SEC East Division opener for both these teams. And usually the winner of this game goes on to bigger and better things. Georgia has won the last five in a row. But keep in mind, you take out last year's 18 to nothing shutout in which Georgia won. And four of the last six meetings between these two teams have been decided by six or less points. And you know Steve Spurrier has to be tempted, Mark. Some kind of double pass or some kind of gimmick play right now. You really feel that. I haven't seen much of it yet. Little bootleg action, the pass complete to Andy Boyd, who had a touchdown catch a week ago against Louisiana Lafayette. We talked about some of the animosity and some of the vitriol that exists between Georgia fans and Steve Spurrier. Here's the recent poll that was taken here in Athens, Georgia, of the most hated coaches, loath coaches in the conference. Spurrier, that's that's a landslide. He loves it. He loves <laughs> it, man. He's like a politician seeing those returns come in. Those big numbers turn him on now. I promise you that. He'd be up more. He'd be more upset if they didn't hate him. Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> And off. This is Davis with the first down and then some taking care of that football, covering it up for the first down. Steve Spurrier has beaten Tennessee at South Carolina. He has beaten Florida at South Carolina, but he has yet to win against the Georgia Bulldogs while being the head coach of South Carolina. Mark, and you mentioned you only play five Southeast Conference East games. This game, there's huge ramifications year in and year out. It's proven late in November. This game is critical to these teams. Last year, South Carolina going 8-5, and five, winning their bowl game. Georgia coming off a 9-4 and four season. Out of the backfield, Davis on the reception, kicking it into gear and picking up about four yards on the play with 11.22 to go. Davis and Boyd doing a nice job out of the backfield for South Carolina. Mark, I don't think there's been a turnover in this game. Has there? No, there hasn't. You know, you get the feeling one of these defenses needs to really step up and create a big play defensively. See, Coach Martinez, the defensive coordinator, was looking forward to matching wits against Steve Spurrier. Corey Boyd now in the ball game. Boy, it helps having that experienced quarterback under center as you see Blake Mitchell check off. Tried to hit the hot receiver. Boy, they got a very fortuitous bounce that time, complete to number 82, Freddie Brown. A pickup of seven, and that's going to be a first down for the Gamecocks. And this is a well-coached quarterback right here. He sees the corner fire coming, and right now, you know, you'd love to see him keep his feet. The ball was tipped a little bit by Asher Allen, the corner, or it could have been some open field tackling right there to see if Rashad Jones could have got him on the ground. Yeah, good call, and uh, Freddie Brown's father, Freddie II, was his high school coach. He made the catch on the play. First down and 10. 
Handoff between the tackles across midfield down to the 48-yard line. Corey Boyd once again. Boyd coming off a very prolific week last week in which he had two touchdowns against Louisiana Lafayette. Got the game ball, and actually Steve Spurrier in kind of tweaking his team a little bit, Bob, saying, man, we weren't that good last week. I had to give the game ball to somebody, so why not give it to the guy that scored a couple of touchdowns? How's that for a backhanded cop? Man, there'll be a bunch of game balls in that locker room tonight if they can pull this one out there. Ten and a half to go. Mitchell has time and delivers a strike at the 34-yard line. This one to Jared Cook. surgery on that Georgia defense and that time Brandon Miller number 12 this is just man-to-man -man coverage the Sam linebacker on the tight end that's a good route by Jared Cook that's kind of a hybrid wide receiver and you know what Blake Mitchell has heated up Mark he's extremely accurate in the second half here he's managed the game pretty well a first and ten from the Georgia 34. When he's doing a lot at the line of scrimmage, getting them in and out of plays. Luxury of having a 50-year senior completes this pass to McKinley, and he put his hat down and got a couple of extra yards. Going right through Brian Evans, the quarterback, Kenny McKinley picking up 11 more. Mark, I think he went sidearm that time and threw it underneath Danell Ellerby, the linebacker. Let's see right here where he throws this football. You're going to see 33, the linebacker, come on the blitz. No, nah, he got it over top of him, but that's a great throw with it, with LRB in his face right there. Certainly was. And we've talked so much about Matthew Stafford, maybe Blake Mitchell trying to make a statement of his own. Looking like a cross between a traffic cop and a crossing guard there checking off and checking into the right play Corey Boyd yep yeah, up tell me about what he's doing those those machinations those movements at the line of scrimmage I'll tell you the first thing Mark Blake Mitchell is doing a tremendous job that's like Steve Spurrier under center right now just getting him in the right play the Corey Boyd a guy that has so much invested you think of his life story all he's been through I mean he is a grown man out there Mark he knows how big this game is, not only for South Carolina, but for his future as well. And Boyd has emerged from, from very trying circumstances in his environment in Orange, New Jersey. Mitchell, meanwhile, is connected on his last five passes. And that will snap the streak at five, incomplete, but good heat by Cade Weston, applying a little pressure. And for more on Corey Boyd, let's go downstairs to Stacy. Yeah, Mark, you and Bob have talked about Corey's struggles, and I actually asked him just this week, how have you become a man at South Carolina? And he said to me, life will move on with or without me. So what legacy will I leave in life? And guys, besides Blake Mitchell, he's the unprecedented leader of this offense, Mark. Yeah, his action, Stacy, speaking loudly tonight, as they did last week in that win against Louisiana Lafayette. Mark, a field goal is like gold right now, making this a 10-point game. So do not turn the ball over if you're South Carolina. They're going to throw it dangerously into coverage. Wow, Bob. Thomas Flowers could have, might have, almost had a pick. But it's fourth down coming up. In comes the field goal. Here. Mark, he was going to throw that slant, whether it was open or not. That's a pretty good job right there by Thomas Flowers. Really a poor route by Freddie Brown. And now this is the money ball coming up. The money field goal attempt by Ryan Sutton. First team all SEC kicker. This one coming from 34 yards out. He's already connected on two from 41 and 35 yards away. And this one is right between the pipes. <laughs> South Carolina in control almost. Ten points is not exactly insurmountable, but Georgia has to get to work when we come back. No smile creeping across his lips yet. Brought to you by Mitsubishi Motors, driven to thrill. And ESPN Gameplay. See the most college football every Saturday. To order, call your pay-per-view provider. ESPN Game Plan lives here. 
I think the Georgia Bulldogs could use a little of that bounce in their step. Those are the gym dogs, three-time defending NCAA champs, starting practice a few weeks ago. Katie Heenan, the 2007 SEC Gymnast of the Year. Would you call them gym dogs? Gym dogs, that's what they call them. Does, I'm gonna, they I'm sell the joint out. That. I'm going to get confirmation. <laughs> well, I, hey, I think you just came with that one. No, I got sources. Jim Dodge. I got research. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of champions coming out of Georgia these days, uh, not to mention uh, Reese Hoffa, the uh, world champion in the shot put recently over in Osaka, Japan. Congratulations to Reese. They're going to run it out. Uh, Brown out of the end zone, two yards deep. They could use a return, and Brown giving them good field position out at the 40-yard line. Back to Stan Verrett in the studio. All right, guys. TCU and Texas. Colt McCoy in trouble early on. Tory Stewart gets up and pulls that one down and takes it to the house. And TCU with a 10-0 lead on the Longhorns. Texas A&M hangs on to beat Fresno State in triple overtime, 47-45 in Louisiana Tech up on Hawaii. Give it to me, Mark. Give Mark, it to me. You called that TCU Texas upset, didn't you? I called that early. Why'd man. you like that so much? I just like TCU and how they play defense. I think Texas is struggling right now. And defense, the story of the day here in Athens, Georgia, albeit the South Carolina defense giving up some yards to Mikey Henderson on that first down catch. Mark, this is what Georgia and Matt Stafford thrive on. Watch the off coverage right here. They're going to play soft right here. And last week against Oklahoma State, right there, they made a living off of that soft coverage. If I'm Tyrone Nix, come back up on him, man. Challenge him. Challenge him. The formula's worked so far for South Carolina. Stafford now 4 of 10 here in the second half. They picked up 16 on that play. Bulldogs got to get busy. They trail by 10. And another completion right at the first down marker at the 34-yard line to Sean Bailey. You know, Mark, Steve Spurrier made a point to us. They had some players slipping last week. They're wearing new shoes. Watch Munnerlin right here, number one. Right there. He slips out of those shoes. Now, they're wearing all new shoes from a new maker. And it's pretty obvious you see those logos on those <laughs> wristbands, what they're wearing. But they had some problems slipping last week. They did right there. They checked the tread on those tires. Second down and one for the Bulldogs. Underneath, Marino with the first down near the 20-yard line for the Bulldogs. A pickup of 12, and this Georgia offense, which was a rhythmic, now getting a little bit of rhythm. And again, this is kind of an old Steve Spurrier play. A little middle screen right there to no Sean Marino. Matt Stafford, Mark, taking advantage again of soft coverage and screens, just what he did to Oklahoma State last week. That's his wheelhouse. That's his comfort zone. Certainly a guy, Bob, that has learned how to deal with the spotlight here in Athens, Georgia. A couple of incidents over the summer helped him adjust to how it's going to be in the coming years for him. He works out of the shotgun. Blitz coming. Incomplete at the 15-yard line. And speaking of Stafford, Bob, I was referring to some Internet postings and pictures of him during the summertime with a keg hoisted over his head at Talladega Speedway in Alabama. There was nothing illegal about it. There was no... No situation where the authorities or police were involved, but there was speculation, and it taught him how that he's going to be living in a fishbowl for the coming hey, years here. You're a quarterback at a place like this. It can be the best job, it can be a dream, or it can be the worst job in a nightmare. I mean, you are constantly, constantly on stage, on or off the field. Here he is passing it complete to Marino. Boy, they were waiting for him out of the 23-yard line. Isaac was the first one to get there for the Gamecocks along with Stoney Woodson. I'll tell you what, Mark. Matt Stafford and Georgia have made a couple plays in this drive with this South Carolina defense. I mean, I just love the effort. Watch this open field. Just guys running to the ball, playing hard. And Tyrone Nix, as we said, his plan has been wonderful today for South Carolina. Last week he said they had 15 missed tackles. This week, I would hazard a guess the number is much, much lower. Under eight minutes to go. Henderson in motion. Stafford 
incomplete in the end zone. And he got rid of it just in time because he took a hit from Brinkley. It was intended for Henderson, and it's moved down. It comes the field goal unit. That was really good coverage by Darian Stewart. They ran a little wheel route with Mikey Henderson. Darian Stewart almost got picked off right there. That was great coverage. That's really good, Mark. It certainly was. As a result, a 39-yard field goal attempt coming up. And this one is just inside that left upright by Brandon Katu. Now three of four on the night. And the Georgia Bulldogs just a touchdown away. They'll kick it off with 7.37 to go in this division opener when we come back. Stacey Dales. This is the 60th meeting between South Carolina and Georgia, and this would be a huge win for the Gamecocks if they would be able to hang on. That's well, Captain Munnerlin back for the kickoff. How about these two kickers in this game? As we look at Brandon Katu right here, number 96. These are two of the premier kickers in the country. Each of them has made three field goals in this game, Bob. The two is three for three and actually suck at three for three and the two three for four. This guy better protect the football right here, Mark. Munderland. <laughs> yeah, Munderland out to the 21 yard line. Neither team, I know why you mentioned that, neither team has turned it over yet. Corey Boyd has put in a great day. Yeah, and you know, from this point on in this game, as it's been all game, these yards, Mark, are going to be tough to come by. You better have a tough, experienced guy back there protecting the football. It's going to come down to Corey Boyd making some tough yardage against the swarming defense. He's run it 12 times today for 53 yards, along with three catches for 10 yards. 79 yards away. Right now, though, just a field goal would put South Carolina in pretty good standing if they could eat up, eat up a little bit of clock along with it. But this might not be the time to get too conservative. Mitchell fires a strike complete right near the first down marker just beyond the 30 yard line to McKinney. Mark, something you always see with Steve Spurrier quarterbacks, how quick they get that football up to the ear. See right there where he holds that football? They always hold that football high. They always seem to have very similar releases. That's kind of his trademark. That was a heck of a throw right there by Mitchell. And Mitchell putting up the numbers to back up his technique. McKinley, meanwhile, with six catches for 95 yards. Little receiver screen complete for the first down. McKinley once again. Here's a guy who last year was overshadowed big time, but really came on late in the season. Caught two fourth quarter touchdowns in their bowl win against Houston. Former high school quarterback, a heck of an athlete. You know, he's from the state of Georgia. We mentioned 17 scholarship players at South Carolina from Georgia. He's by far their number one wide receiver, Kenny McKinley. And a top returning wide out this season. First down and 10, the clock running, approaching six and a half minutes to go. South Carolina trying to snap a five-game losing streak against Georgia. Mitchell. Oh, wow, was that caught incomplete. But a great effort by Eddie Brown. Freddie Brown made a wonderful last gasp effort. Yeah, that was a great effort. You know, his dad's a high school coach in South Carolina. Freddie Brown got the start right here. This is a great effort by Freddie Brown. That right foot 
very close right there. You get another look at this thing. Keep in mind, you only need one foot in bounds. Hold on now. Oh, that was. I tell you, how about the linesman though? Right on that call. Is that great officiating right there? Yeah. Mark, his foot was on the line, yeah. but I mean the mechanics. Look at the concentration by the linesman. If we could take another look at that, that is great officiating yeah. right there. Yeah, he was halfway, half his foot seemed on the white chalk. They're reviewing it, but not sure that they're going to reverse this one. Talk about the rivalry, Bob, between these two teams. Uh, it was interesting in speaking with some of the Georgia players yesterday, in particular, Marcus Howard, who is from South Carolina. His brother, J.J., played at Clemson. I thought it was interesting how he said that some of the Georgia players went to the South Carolina spring game and hooked up with some of the buddies they had on the other team. One more look at that. Mike, Mark, excuse me. I appreciate this right here. That linesman with all this stuff going on, all that traffic around him. Look at the concentration right there on that spot. And I think it's the right call. I think that right toe is on that line right there. But more than that, I just like the mechanics right there of that guy. Right. Toughest job Boy, is to be an official. I mean, it's not like there aren't bodies out there. Plus, you have all these Georgia guys over here screaming, inco you know, complete, right. complete, complete, incomplete. Boy, that is a great effort. Our official right there, out of bounds. Man, you cannot overrule that. That's big time official. Bob, what about the point I brought up about the South, the, the Georgia guys going to the South Carolina spring game? How about that? And they didn't right. wear any Georgia stuff. Though. <laughs> yeah. They were anonymous. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. When those guys walk in, I think you know they're football players just the way they look. It'd be tough not to. I mean, yeah. that's the thing I talk to our players about all the time. You know, when you walk into class, say, on right. campus, or you walk across campus, you don't have to be wearing some football logo. Yeah. Everybody right knows who you are. The pass is incomplete. South Carolina charged with a timeout. Yeah, it's not like, you know, guys from the debate team, they don't stick out like guys from the football team. <laughs> 6.26 to go. And now South Carolina looking at a second down and 10. He's not buying that. He's not buying that replay just yet. See what he dials up here on the call. Blake Mitchell. Has shown a lot of moxie in managing the ball game here in the second half. And Mark, it's only September 8th, but these plays right now, they dictate what's going to happen in January now, based on the history of this series. That's why this is such a huge, huge game. Yeah, the winner of this game historically has gone on to a higher tier bowl than their opponent. The loser, the screen incomplete for Cook. Be right there to blow it up. I like this guy, Ellerby. I mean, two years ago, they thought he was going to be the next Thomas Davis here. Literally got in the doghouse last year. But watch him close right here, 33. This guy's kind of a big, strong safety in there. He was the one, Ellerby, that said, hey, just because we're inexperienced doesn't mean we're not any good. Everybody yeah. making a lot of noise about how there are eight new starters on defense for Georgia. Third and ten. They've got to get to the 47. Mitchell, oh. incomplete, almost intercepted at midfield. Asher Allen was there. Fourth down coming up with 6.17 to go. And Allen looking heavenward for another opportunity. Tell you what, I'm a big Mikey Henderson guy as the punt return man. This kid is quick. You see Steve Spurrier there talking to Blake Mitchell. This guy right here is a dynamic player. He's been in this program a long time, Mark. He can make something happen now. From nearby Buford, Georgia. Suck up staying on his own 23. Good snap. An end over end punt. Highly returnable. Henderson got a block on the edge. Mikey Henderson beyond midfield. That's the play that they were looking for. Got a nice block from C.J. Bird along the way. And Georgia will start off in good field position on South Carolina's side of the field when we come back. Time winding down on the Georgia Bulldogs. 
Can they rise up to the challenge here at home? We'll find out in just a moment. A race before the chase, the Chevy Rock and Roll 400 in Richmond. Dan and Georgia's engine starting to rev up. That was Sean Bailey on the catch, working against Captain Munnellin for the first down. Georgia trailing by seven points, approaching six minutes to go. Great throw by Matt Stafford. I mean, they're up there playing bump and run man to man. That's a great throw and a great reaction by Sean Bailey because look how much his head was so late turning around. That ball was on top of him. Remember all this set up by that 32-yard punt return by Mikey Henderson. It was the first start of the day in South Carolina territory for Georgia. Sutherland in motion. They give it to Brown. Actually, that's Marino. And Marino stopped up his forward progress. Marked around the 22-yard line. We're under the lights here at Sanford Stadium. Georgia hosting South Carolina. Georgia ranked number 11 in the country with a five-game winning streak against their rivals from just three hours away on the interstate highway. I'm Mark Jones along with Bob Davey and Stacey Dales down in the field. And South Carolina has led the entire night. Most people talk about wanting the playoff in college football. What are they talking about? <laughs> this is a playoff game right now on September 8th. It's all the marbles right now on this, on this game for the Southeast Conference East. And right now, Georgia's Marino answering the immediacy and finality of the challenge. Got a good block from Chester Adams. And a 10-yard game. Greg Lumpen likes it too. Mark, this is a great cutback you see right there. Excellent block right there by 63 Chris Davis. And Marino just hits that little crease right there. Pretty good open field tackle right there. He put his hat down too. Marino is not afraid to go over you, around you, or through an opponent. That's working out of the eye. Play fake. Into the end zone. Incomplete intended for Moore. And he's working against Carlos Thomas. It'll be second down and 10 coming up. Mark Matthew Stafford had Trip Chandler, the tight end again. Watch the tight end release right here on the safety. And he's going to be open for about the second or third time tonight. Watch right there. He is open. Actually working against the linebacker right there. See if Chandler uh, told his quarterback something about that going back to the huddle. Sometimes they have a habit of doing that. You saw the numbers from Stafford on the night. Marino, meanwhile, with his first 100-yard rushing game of his career. And Mark, again, I think this is four-down territory for Georgia already. The field goal doesn't do them much good. He goes into the end zone. Incomplete. And well defended by Captain Munderland. And there's a flag down on the play on the far side of the field at the 12-yard line. And, Mark, we're going to get a false start on number 67, right, Big snap, Chester Adams. False start, 67 offense. Five-yard penalty, still second down. Please reset the game clock to 454. 454. Mark Richter, his new role is overseer, not calling the plays. Here's what they did call. Oh, yeah. Adams pulled down to there way, way too early. Mm -hmm. Adams, one of their veterans up there, a junior who's made 11 starts in his career. Pushes it back to the 17. Chandler has been one of their more reliable receivers tonight. But the Gamecock defense has been equal to most challenges. Over the middle, and that one was a little bit hot. It was intended for Chandler. But I think if you ask Stafford, he'd admit it was a little bit of a hot pass. Well, you talk about that Tampa cover, too. Watch the linebacker right here, Brinkley, how deep he gets. And the tight end is wide open underneath him. I mean, it really was pitch and catch. See the linebacker right now? Look at the space in there. That was an easy throw and catch, Mark. Oh. You know, Stafford's made a couple throws tonight that have been a little erratic. That's pretty easy right yeah. there. After the incompletion, third and 15. They've got to get down to the two-yard line for the first down. And a field goal does them no good. As you mentioned, Bob, it's probably four-down territory with 4.50 to go. Heat coming. Hit. And incomplete. Oh, that was...
was in about two or three different sets of hands. One of the guys that couldn't hold it was Tony Wilson. It was juggled by apparently two or three different people down there, and that's Wilson who was shaken up on the play. Mark, first, it was a great job by Matt Stafford of avoiding the rush through the football off balance, but made a great throw to Tony Wilson. Watch him avoid the rush right here, steps to his right. That's a great throw. No question right there. Good job at dislodging that football, but. Emmanuel Cook with the hit right there, number 21. And you know the old saying, Mark, you're going to get hit anyhow. Go ahead and make that catch. I know it's easier said than done. Manuel Cook, the guy that made the hit on the play, uh, coming off of an appendectomy not that long ago. You know, Tony Wilson dropped the ball last week in the game against Oklahoma State. And one of the tags on these Georgia receivers, and these Georgia fans know all too well, they've been unable to come up with the big catch, had a lot of drops. Hey, Bob, fourth and 15, by the way. What do we do here if you're Mark Richter or Mike Bobo, who's calling the plays now? I mean, Boy, I, a field goal, know, does it really do anything for you? No. The only thing a field goal does, if you score a touchdown, you win the game. Okay. On fourth and 15, I would probably go ahead with a guy like Brandon Katu and get the field goal, try to win it with a touchdown. Right now, you're telling your defense that you've got to come up with a three and out almost for the offense. Katu which is now routine for him, knocks it through. That's his fourth field goal of the night, which includes makes from 33, 44, and 39 yards out. This one from 34. And Georgia to within four points at 16-12. And this is a team that is used to late comebacks. Last year against Colorado, they were down by 13. Joe Cox with a 20-yard touchdown pass to Milner. And then against Georgia Tech, another comeback. Massaqua with a big catch and then later in the season against Virginia Tech in their bowl game a big play on defense an interception by Tony Taylor doing the job and you know they've had their opportunities even right there on that drive the tight end trip Chandler wide open Matthew Stafford overthrow that Tony Wilson really could have made that catch mark for a touchdown so they've had opportunities now it's about your defense get the football back if you're Steve Spurrier do not turn it over worst case scenario just let your defense have a chance to win it for you at the end a punt is not a bad thing for South Carolina if they keep the ball a little bit we've seen South Carolina Bob though earlier tonight albeit not this late throw the ball on a situation where it was third and maybe five or so to go, you'd think they'd be a little bit more conservative. Is it in Steve Spurrier's nature to be conservative? I think we've seen him tonight, and I give him a lot of credit because he's taken his ego out of it. And really, he has since he's been the head coach at South Carolina, Mark. You know how important the offense is and the wide open throw the ball every down type of attack. He's really played to his strengths early here at South Carolina of letting the defense win it for you be pretty conservative on offense I give him a lot of credit he's doing what he has to do right now to win games the kickoff from the 30 yard line down at the two Munnerlin ball security paramount right now for the Gamecocks and Munnerlin brought down at the 23 as we go back to Stan Verrett in the studio BYU all right, Mark, BYU has the longest win streak in the country right now at 11 straight after Boise State's loss. Cougars taking on UCLA. That's Max Hall to Austin Collie. And BYU is within three now out in Southern California. South Florida getting ready to take on Auburn. Matt Grothy and company getting a big test against the Tigers tonight. We'll see if the upstarts from the Big East can win on the Plains. Yes, Dan, uh, South Florida, one of those vote picks to do well this year. Mike Davis in a tailback. And Davis on the carry. Nice seam over the left side. And he picks up a first down out to the 38-yard line. They gashed that defensive front. 
A 15-yard gain by the Gamecocks. And mark number three, Brian Evans, the corner from Georgia, let that football get outside. Right here, Brian Evans has to stay out and force that football back into your help. Might have got his jersey tugged on just a little <laughs> bit right there. Just shy of the 40-yard line. South Carolina with the lead and uh, doing it in a different type of way, doing it on the ground and good managing of the game by Blake Mitchell, the quarterback. Boyd back in, as I mentioned, doing it on the ground across midfield, another first down. Lacerating that defense once again to pick up 12. Under four minutes to play. Impressive run right there. That was supposed to go outside to his right, cut it back to his left. And you know what? If you're going to win the Southeastern Conference and you're going to win the SEC East right now, Mark, three minutes and 30, three minutes and 52 seconds. Here we are in September 8th. Can you line up and just take it right now if you're South Carolina? It's there for you to win right now. They could mass to be in a better position. Bouncing back or trying to from the 18 0 shutout a season ago against these Georgia Bulldogs. They run it again. Boyd with another huge chunk of real estate for the first down. Anderson with a good block up front. And right now, this is a macho type of game up front in South Carolina, Bob, just beating up Georgia. Mark, you are absolutely right. I mean, everybody in the stadium knows that Steve Spurrier right now is going to run that football, and they have taken it so far and just stuffed it down Georgia's throat. Time to man up, and Corey Boyd is getting his man on in a huge way. And it has a furrowed brow on Mark Richt right now on the other side of the field. Why not run it again? Davis this time plowing his way over the left side of the line of scrimmage. Got about two on the play. Under three minutes to go. And if you're Georgia, you know, a giving up a field goal right now, Mark, does not kill you because that only makes it a seven-point game potentially. The key is the clock. I mean, you cannot let them have another first down because of the clock. You only have two timeouts left. Each team with two timeouts remaining. Three-yard gain sets up a second and seven. Davison Boyd doing a nice job in the backfield. Martinez, Coach Martinez, the defensive coordinator for Georgia. His team looking for a play here. They run it again. Keeping it on the ground. And this isn't a bad place to call timeout right here. If you're Georgia, Mark, I hate to let that thing run down much further. Obviously, this is a huge third down, and they'll use it after this. That was Davis on the run. Last couple of games, Georgia has outrushed South Carolina, but South Carolina has flipped the script this time in a huge way. How about this call right now if you're Steve Spurrier? Third down and four. Do you run the ball and make Georgia call timeout? He's going to take it all the way down, use all the 25-second clock, and then call timeout himself to think about this call. But you're the old ball coach. You're an offensive guy that likes to throw. Do you throw it right now, or do you run it? I'm putting it on you right now. <laughs> I'm going to keep it on the ground because it's been working, but I've got an even more... Uh imposing question after we take a look at what has transpired on this drive and they have moved it inexorably down the field getting good chunks at a time between Davis and Boyd both of them sharing the offensive load keeping it between the tackles and we're looking at a third down and about four to go you talked about whether you throw it or run it I say is it maybe four down territory? Do you take two shots at getting a first down here? You might, but I wouldn't mind having that field goal with a kicker like suck up, although it'd be a long field goal from right here. I know one thing for sure. I would put the ball in number three's hands, Corey Boyd. I'm either going to run it or I'm going to throw him a little swing pass, but I'm putting the ball in number three's hands. He's a man. Give it to Boyd and see what happens after that. And of course, you know, Ryan Suckup is a, an all SEC. There he is.
place kicker. He was first team all SEC. And Mark, you're looking at a 49 yard field goal, 47 yard field goal. It very well could be four down territory. Corey Boyd not in the game right now. Mike Davis in a tailback. Third down and about four to go. Oh, a reverse, and Georgia was waiting home on it. Marcus Howard. And now it's fourth down. Georgia calls a timeout. Do you like it? And it Do you like the call, though? <laughs> too much time to transpire. It didn't too work. Much That's time why to you evolve. didn't like it. If that play would have worked, you'd have said that guy He's is a, a genius. genius over on that sideline. <laughs> Again, though, Georgia penetrating defense, and our guy Marcus Howard up the field made a huge play right there. What about Marcus Howard? A special gesture by him today. Have to mention the fact that he was honoring his fallen teammate, Antavius Coates, wearing his number 17. Howard usually wears a different number, number 38, but Howard is a guy that has undergone four different ACL surgeries, four different surgeries on his knee, and Marcus Howard said, hey, I'm gonna honor my man today by wearing his number. That's a great story, Mark. And he meant it from the heart. I mean, he was legitimately doing it for the right reasons. But how about this decision? Fourth down, here's the coin toss before the game. Yeah, Coates is out there, made an honorary captain, number 17, blew out his knee in high school, had three more surgeries, and now his number being weared by Howard. I think this is a good decision. You punt? It would be a 52-yard field goal, correct? Yes. Punt the ball, make them go the distance, and put it all on your defense. Well, the defense, Bob, has been equal to the challenge today. And why not put it on them? Boy, he didn't give himself a chance no. there, Mark. He kicked it right through the back of the end zone. Didn't aim for the corner, didn't hang it up. 36 yards on the punt, but it's a net of 16 because it comes out to the 20. Hey, if you're Matt Stafford right now, what a great opportunity. Man. Is this not a great opportunity to take this football and see if you can execute down the field? Now, the problem, only one time out. Well, last year in the bowl game against Georgia, Virginia Tech, pardon me, he rallied them from an 18-point deficit. This one, just four points, but just 120 to go. True freshman offensive tackle in the game for Georgia. Can they keep Stafford upright on this defining drive? Plenty of time. Out of the backfield. Brown with the catch, a couple of yards shy of the first down. Mark, you have a freshman left guard in a freshman tackle on the field in the Southeastern Conference. Yeah, you're talking about Trenton Sturdivant right there, number 75. 6'5", 286 pounds, a true freshman who just a, several days into workouts this spring sees that starting job at left tackle. Well, he's described as a, quote-unquote, just a pup by his coaches. Well, Bob. here's the big pup, freshman <laughs> Sturdivant. The freshman next to him, Chris Davis. Three new starters on that offensive line for Georgia. How yes. about two freshmen, though, right now? Yeah. Let's look at that offensive line for the Bulldogs. They really rely on Fernando Velasco up front, the senior, for a lot of leadership. Haverkamp is a junior college transfer. Adams has a little bit of starting experience, but relatively speaking, a young group up there. And you know, run after the catch right now is so critical for Georgia. That's They're not going to have a lot of yeah. time now. That's what they had a lot of last week against Oklahoma State. Stafford complete to Sutherland, a reliable target out of bounds. And he's pushed out of bounds at the 37. That's a first down for the Bulldogs. 107 to go. Georgia with no timeouts remaining. South Carolina with one. A field goal does Georgia no good. They need to score. South Carolina three-man rush. Mark playing a very conservative coverage right here. We'll see if it's too conservative. Stafford fires incomplete at the 38-yard line intended for Sean Bailey. Bob pointed out to 
South Carolina rushing just three. Tyrone Nitz's defense has done a superb job. Let me show you what they're doing. They're playing three deep, but they're playing corners hard to keep everything inside them so Georgia can't throw the ball on the sideline, Mark. They're making Georgia throw the ball in the middle of the field. Right here, down the middle of that football field is where you're going to make some yards if you're Georgia. A deep squaring route right now. Here's Stafford out of the shotgun. Behind his receiver, the tight end, Trip Chandler. And it's third down coming up. He struggled tonight a little bit. He's made some throws to some wide open receivers that should have been complete. He's made some tough ones look easy and some easy ones look difficult. Yeah, I mean, definitely. You know, he's a young guy. I mean, he is still a true sophomore, Mark. 18 of 40 today. A total of 196 yards. Throw the football right in the middle of that G, in the middle of that football field, and you have a chance to make some yardage right now. South Carolina poised and ready for the upset here with under a minute to go. There it is. And the pass is complete right near that G at the 47-yard line in South Carolina territory. Henderson, who has been a big play guy for them tonight, picking up 16, moving the chains. 53 seconds to go. Georgia has no timeouts remaining. Mark, South Carolina has one. That is the void, and he's getting plenty of time against this three-man rush. Stafford incomplete at the 42 for Bailey. No reason to rush that throw if you're Matt Stafford. There was no one within five yards of him. And he kind of three-step dropping through the football out in the flat. Well, his idol, the guy that he modeled his game after, also wore number seven. His name was John Elway. Matthew Stafford uh, looking for an Elway-esque drive here to define his young career. Three of six on this drive. Going up top, downtown into coverage. And it's incomplete, almost intercepted by Carlos Thomas. And man, would he like that one back again. And he's a little shaken up. Uh, let me show you what happened on that. It looked like a two deep coverage. Right now, it looks like two safeties. Then on the snap of the ball, it's going to rotate and end up with three safeties. See right here, the corner bailout? So all of a sudden, he thought he had two deep coverage, and it was three deep, and Matt Stafford just threw the football up in the air. Very fortunate right there. Carlos Thomas didn't end this game. Third down and 10 coming up for Georgia now. A trips left formation for Stafford. And he's under duress this time. They missed the sack. Oh. Stafford eludes trouble. A flag down. The catch made. Moore. And he coughs it up. No, they're going to rule it down. And there's a couple of flags down in the play. And this one's going to come back. With 25 seconds to go. Mark, we're going to get Thomas Brown with a block in the back on Casper Brinkley. If that's the case, this would be a costly penalty against the Bulldogs. Mark, I don't think there's any doubt on this one. Block in the back, 20 of the offense. Ten-yard penalty from the previous spot, be third down. It's clear. Yeah. What happens anytime that quarterback scrambles, all those angles change. And that looks easy to avoid, but it's not. That's tough right there. Casper Brinkley threw his arms up in the air to kind of sell it a little bit to the official who bought it. Pushes it back to a third and 20. And a little premature movement on the right side of that offensive line by the Bulldogs. Dead ball, false start. 67 offense. And a Five big pull in here. Didn't down. Lee Corso say that Steve Spurrier could coach 400 years. Oh, you brought up Lee Corso. At South huh? Carolina <laughs> and not win. Was it the SEC? He didn't think. I'm going to tell you what, I'm not jumping totally on the boat. But if they can hold on here, Mark, this is a huge win for South Carolina. It would be a defining win during the short tenure for Steve Spurrier. This one up for grabs. Jump ball and knocked away. It's picked off by Brinkley. 
Jasper Brinkley. And that might just do it with six seconds to go.